Chapter Thirteen of the Fairy Tales of Science by John Cargill Brogue. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Flight Through Space. We Fly by Night. Macbeth. Let us take our station on a clear evening in some wide open plain and gaze upward and around at the star spangled heavens that shroud and reveal, reveal and shroud, the unfathomable mystery of the infinite and eternal though from the spot we occupy in space we can only see a small portion of the visible universe yet even with the naked eye we behold a multitude of bright luminaries as we continue to watch them we find that the immense majority of them shine with a twinkling light and retain the same relative position to each other whilst the remainder very few in number shed a steady light and change their places continually returning at given periods in the same path we are thus led to divide the heavenly bodies within the sphere of our perception into two principal classes or systems the sidereal as we will call it here for convenience sake and the planetary the stars belonging to the former are popularly called fixed stars although this term in its strictest acceptation must be held not to be quite applicable to them as they unquestionably have measurable motions of their own those belonging to the latter are called erratic or wandering stars popularly planets from a greek word signifying a wanderer these include the sun moon and our own earth and the other planetary bodies as well as the comets the erratic stars constitute with the sun about which they move as their common centre or focus in obedience to the great universal law of gravitation revealed to us by the genius of newton and his sublime predecessor the illustrious kepler the solar system which however so infinitesimally small in comparison to the infinite magnitude and extent of the sidereal world men must naturally regard with greater and more vivid nay if the expression may be permitted us with more affectionate interest than the universe beyond moreover the bodies composing this system are comparatively near to us and more within the reach of our observation than the fixed stars which are placed at immeasurable distances from us let us therefore first take as we are being wafted on with our planet through space a rapid survey of them before proceeding to the contemplation of the world of worlds beyond by a long series of patient observations of a most delicate kind aided by the telescope and other marvellous instruments devised by human ingenuity and by refined combinations of theoretical reasoning and logical induction man has succeeded in measuring the dimensions gauging as it were the contents and weighing as in a balance the mass not of our earth alone but of all the other planets and of the great sun himself thus we know that the equatorial diameter of our globe is about seven thousand nine hundred twenty six the polar diameter seven thousand nine hundred miles that our earth revolves round its axis with a velocity of nearly twelve miles in a minute and that it moves in its orbit round the sun at a rate of more than one thousand miles a minute that its distance from the sun is ninety five million miles the moon the satellite of the earth is distant from it some two hundred and forty thousand miles and revolves around it in twenty seven and a half days its diameter measures only two thousand one hundred and eighty miles of the other planetary bodies some are considerably larger some smaller than our earth the largest of all the brightest among them is jupiter with a diameter of about eighty eight thousand miles and a bulk thirteen hundred times that of the earth owing to his inferior density his mass is however only upwards of three hundred seventy times that of our globe perpetual spring reigns on this king of planets jupiter is attended by four satellites or moons with the exception of one each of them larger than our moon which revolve round him from west to east his distance from the sun is four hundred and eighty five million miles his revolution round the great centre of the planetary world occupies twelve years the next in size is saturn with a diameter of seventy nine thousand miles and accordingly about a thousand times larger than the earth he is eight hundred and ninety million miles distant from the sun and revolves round it in twenty nine years a revolving luminous ring consisting of three distinct portions one within the other surrounds this most remarkable planet and eight satellites revolve round him uranus was up to adams leverrier's and gall's recent discovery of neptune considered the most distant planet from the solar centre of the system the distance being calculated at one billion eight hundred million miles and the period of revolution eighty-four years the diameter of uranus 
is thirty five thousand miles and the bulk about eighty the mass about twenty times that of the earth at least four satellites are known to revolve round him and several more undoubtedly exist neptune now the most distant known planet from the sun two billion eight hundred million miles revolves round the latter in one hundred and sixty five years the diameter of this planet is thirty seven thousand five hundred miles the bulk about one hundred seven times that of the earth the mass about the same as that of uranus among the lesser planets we have to mention mercury the one nearest the solar centre being distant from it by only thirty seven million miles the period of his revolution is eighty eight days his diameter is about three thousand two hundred miles from the close proximity of this planet to the sun it is conjectured that the mean heat in it is above that of boiling quicksilver and even near the poles water would always boil its mass is about one twelfth that of the earth the mean density rather greater than that of our planet venus next to jupiter the brightest and most important and interesting of the planets has a diameter of about seventy eight hundred miles some sixty eight million miles distant from the centre of the solar system she revolves round it in two hundred twenty four days nearly of equal size mass and density as the earth and with a comparatively trifling difference of about twenty seven million miles between the respective distances of the two planets from the sun venus would be supposed to present the same climatological and meteorological conditions as her sister planet and this would unquestionably be the case but that venus happens to turn most obliquely round her axis whence it results that snow and ice cannot accumulate at the poles which are subjected by turns for some four months to the fierce glare of an almost vertical sun and that there are no temperate zones in that planet as in ours though an atmosphere much loaded with clouds would certainly seem to mitigate in some measure the intense glare and heat of the sunshine mars the nearest of the superior planets exterior to the earth presents more points of similarity to the latter than any of the other his diameter is about four thousand one hundred miles his distance from the solar centre round which he revolves in six hundred and eighty seven days one hundred and forty two million miles his mass is about one seventh part of that of the earth and his density a trifle smaller he is evidently surrounded by an atmosphere of considerable density he shines with a red and fiery light seen through a good telescope his disk presents something like a vague delineation of seas and continents near the poles a zone of white is seen clearly denoting the existence of large masses of snow the climate of this planet must be considerably colder than ours but from the similar obliquity of the elliptic and almost identical period of diurnal rotation of the two the changes of the seasons must be very similar to our own though with much greater variations besides these larger planets there are found between mars and jupiter about thirty smaller planets and asteroids most of them exceedingly minute and discernible only through the telescope vesta and pallas are the brightest among them and may when nearest to us be just barely detected with the naked eye though even then with greatest difficulty only to convey to the mind of the reader an intelligible general impression of the relative magnitudes and distances of the principal parts of the planetary system let a globe two feet in diameter be placed on a well-leveled field to represent the sun mercury will then be represented by a grain of mustard seed on the circumference of a circle one hundred sixty four feet in diameter for its orbit venus will appear as a pea on a circle two hundred and eighty four feet in diameter the earth of the same size on a circle of four hundred and thirty feet mars of the size of a rather large pin's head on a circle of six hundred and fifty four feet juno ceres vesta and pallas grains of sand in orbits of from one thousand to twelve hundred feet jupiter a moderate size orange on a circle about seven hundred and twenty yards across saturn a smaller orange on a circle of four-fifths of a mile uranus a small plum on the circumference of a circle above a mile and a half in diameter neptune a somewhat larger plum on the circumference of a circle about two miles and a third in diameter having thus briefly glanced at the planetary satellites of the sun we will now proceed to view with equal briefness that great centre of the system itself which feeds and vivifies them all with its glorious rays the stupendous globe which we call the sun is about one million four hundred thousand times as large as our earth its diameter being eight hundred and eighty five thousand miles 
However, its density being only 0.2543 as compared to that of the Earth, it contains only 354,936 times the mass or quantity of ponderable matter that the latter consists of. It turns on its axis in 25 and a quarter days, as proved by telescopic observations of certain dark spots on its surface. The sun apparently moves round the earth, though it is in reality the latter body which moves round the sun in a nearly circular orbit, described in a plane, sensibly fixed, called the elliptic. The ancients called that portion of the heavens in which the sun's apparent orbit is performed the zodiac, and divided the great circle formed by the intersection of the plane of this orbit with the sphere of the heavens into twelve equal portions or signs, named in order Aries, Taurus, Gemini, Cancer, Leo, Virgo, Libra, Scorpio, Sagittarius, Capricornus, Aquarius, Pisces. The sun, however, has also a real motion. He moves with the entire solar system in the direction of the constellation of Hercules in the western sky. The sun's rays are the ultimate source of all the motions observed on the surface of our planet and of all the vegetable and animal life on it, since it is by their vivifying action that plants are elaborated from inorganic matter to become in their turn the support of animals and of man, and the source of our great coal deposits, so felicitously and truly called by the late George Stevenson, bottled sunshine. By the unequal action of the solar heat are produced all winds and storms, and those disturbances in the electric equilibrium of the atmosphere which give rise to the phenomena of terrestrial magnetism. By the solar rays, the waters of the sea are drawn up into the air in vapor, to descend again in rain, irrigating and fertilizing the land, and producing springs and rivers. To their action and influence must mainly and primarily be attributed the chemical compositions and decompositions of the elements of nature, nay, even the phenomena of volcanic activity. Judging by what we see around us on our own globe, and by the way in which every corner of it is crowded with living beings, and arguing from the most natural of all analogies, most, if not all, of the other larger planets of our solar system must be held to be habitable and inhabited worlds like our Earth. By nations in the infancy of intellectual development, the heavens above and around us might have been looked upon as a kind of solid arch, vault or canopy, hung with greater and lesser lamps intended solely for the special behoof and benefit of the puny dwellers on this puny atom which we call our earth but we of a generation immeasurably more advanced in knowledge to whom the beneficence of the creator has deigned to unclasp the first volume of the great book of nature that we may read the marvellous page and bow down and adore the infinite wisdom that conceived the infinite power that made this glorious world we who are permitted to walk in the light of knowledge and science before which the desponding comment of athena's wisest son upon human knowledge that all we know is nothing can be known stands rebuked and disproved we who may span with a thought the inconceivable distance which separates our planet from the threshold of space we can no longer entertain the same crude and unintelligent notion of the nature and purpose of the works of the divine hand the discoveries of science have disclosed to us in each planet which like our own revolves in regulated periods round the sun provisions in all respects similar to those found to exist here the same structure form and materials the same action and influence of the same calorific and illuminating agency the same alterations of light and darkness produced by the same means the same pleasing succession of seasons the same diversity of climate the same agreeable distribution of land and water. With the overwhelming evidence of these most essential analogies between our own and the other planets before our mind, how can we doubt but that those other celestial structures have been made, provided, and fitted by God to be the abodes of sentient beings kindred to the denizens of our earth? As direct evidence of the fact, however, remains as yet still denied us, attempts have not been, and even now are not wanting, to throw doubt on the correctness of this inference from our analogical reasoning. But most of the arguments adduced against the supposition of the planets being inhabitable globes like our Earth are of too flimsy and futile a nature to be deserving even of a passing illusion. Others have been convincingly refuted. Thus, to give an instance, 
it has been advanced that jupiter saturn uranus and neptune being severally five nine eighteen and twenty-eight times farther removed from the sun than our earth the heating and illuminating power of the solar rays must be in these large planets respectively twenty five eighty one three hundred twenty four and seven hundred eighty four times less than on our globe which would preclude the possibility of the existence on them of beings organized like the denizens of earth the simple consideration however that a mere enlargement of the pupil of the eye in the ratio of the diminution of the apparent superficial magnitude of the sun's disk as respectively beheld from these planets or a proportionally increased sensibility of the retina would leave the illuminating power of the sun the same as that at the earth and that in like manner the diminished calorific power of the solar rays might be compensated by modified atmospheric conditions will suffice to dispose of this objection the only tenable argument against the habitableness of those large globes might be that from their vast magnitude in comparison to the earth the effects of gravity upon them would be such as to unfit species organized like those of the latter for existence there since they would in fact be crushed to pieces under the enormous pressure of their own weight but leaving out of consideration the very obvious expedient of a proportionate adaption of the size and weight of the bodies placed upon these globes to the respective magnitudes of the latter a more careful examination of the question an application of the rule that the weight of bodies placed upon the surface of a globe depends conjointly on the quantity of matter in the globe and on the distance of the body from its centre will at once show that owing to the inferior density of the matter composing the four large planets which in comparison to that of the matter composing the earth is for jupiter as one to four for saturn as one to eight and a half for uranus and neptune as one to six the weight of bodies placed on the surfaces of the three latter planets actually does not differ much from their weight on the earth whilst in the case of jupiter it is only two and three-quarter times greater than that upon the terrestrial globe in the case of the moon we are led to believe from the desolate bleakness of her surface and the total absence of all indications of an atmosphere that she is not inhabited by organized beings but even here how know we but that the most beneficent emanation of the self-evolving energy divine that most powerful agent in the mysterious chemistry of the spheres the all-vivifying rays of the sun may not be silently at work refitting even that cinder of an extinct world for the habitation of kindred beings the satellites of the other planets have been proved by astronomical observation to be under physical conditions similar to that of the moon and it is probable therefore that they are at all events not as yet in a proper state of habitability finally as regards the planetoids or asteroids whether we look upon them in the light of fragments of a smashed or exploded planet or in that of germs or constituent elements of a future planet in process of formation by coalescing and agglomeration it is plain that they present none of the leading and essential analogies to our earth that are observed in the larger planets to those strange wanderers of the sky comets we intend to devote a separate chapter and will therefore now at once wing our flight beyond the narrow limits of our solar system to the confines of the visible universe to the threshold of the abyss of space beyond the innumerable multitude of celestial bodies which seemingly preserve from age to age the same relative situation in the heavens and are therefore popularly called fixed stars although as we have already taken occasion to observe they have unquestionably all of them measurable motions of their own too slow indeed to be sensibly perceptible yet none the less real were classified by the ancients into fanciful groups called constellations to which names were assigned either from some supposed resemblance of the outlines of the group to figures of men animals or other objects for example ursa major ursa minor draco aquila cygnus serpens the names of the signs of the zodiac which we have already given lyra etc or by way of a special tribute of veneration to some departed hero or heroine for example hercules perseus andromeda cassiopeia etc or from the most grovelling adulation of which the name coma berenice bestowed upon a constellation above leo affords a most striking instance berenice daughter of magus of gyrene and wife of ptolemy the third king of egypt rejoiced in an abundance of very beautiful hair of which she was inordinately vain 
a portion of this had been suspended in a temple from which it was suddenly missed one day to the great consternation of the courtiers who had reason to dread the anger of the bereaved beauty however conon the astronomer a sharp fellow in his way luckily bethought himself of the notable expedient of looking for the missing locks in the heavens where sure enough he beheld them quite plain the same having been translated to that exalted position by the gods evidently on account of their surpassing loveliness the laureate of the egyptian court callimachus wrote a poem thereon the delicate flattery succeeded to the fullest extent the queen was more than satisfied and the coma berenice shines down on us to the present day the catalogue of stars which forms part of the famous almagest of ptolemy of alexandria an astronomer who flourished in the second century after christ contains one thousand twenty two stars arranged in forty eight such constellations this catalogue of stars is generally held to be the most ancient on record however this is a popular error an earlier catalogue had been drawn up about one twenty five b c by the illustrious hipparchus the greatest astronomer of antiquity and indeed up to the days of the immortal kepler the catalogue of hipparchus supplied the materials from which ptolemy compiled his at present there are some one hundred and thirty thousand stars catalogued although these fanciful divisions and classifications of the stars are altogether lacking a scientific or other practical and intelligible basis and would seem as sir john herschel truly and pertinently observes to have been purposely named and delineated to cause as much confusion as possible yet the general convenience which they afford is so great and the stars have in process of time become so intensely identified with their names that they have for ages been permitted and must even in our own days still be permitted to retain them a much more rational division of the stars however is that into classes according to their apparent brightness these classes astronomers term magnitudes the brightest stars are said to be of the first magnitude those next in brightness of the second magnitude and so forth the stars down to the sixth magnitude are visible to the naked eye it requires however tolerably good eyes to distinguish those of the sixth magnitude even on very clear evenings for stars below the sixth magnitude we must have recourse to telescopes with the aid of the most powerful of these instruments we can at present discern stars down to the twentieth magnitude and even below the number of stars of the first magnitude is very small only about twenty of them being counted in the heavens those of the second magnitude number sixty five of the third one hundred ninety of the fourth four hundred twenty five of the fifth one thousand one hundred of the sixth three thousand two hundred of the seventh thirteen thousand of the eighth forty thousand of the ninth one hundred and forty two thousand which gives a total number of two hundred thousand stars down to the ninth magnitude as a glance at these figures will show the numbers increase very rapidly as we descend in the scale of brightness to conceive a notion still most inadequate however of the countless multitudes of stars that are dispersed through infinite space we need simply reflect that sir william herschel through his powerful telescope discovered some eighteen millions of stars of an average magnitude between the tenth and eleventh in the milky way alone that great luminous band which stretches all across the sky from horizon to horizon what inconceivable numbers should we arrive at were we to go down to the twentieth magnitude or attempt to count the myriads of star clusters composing those clouds of suns that are comprehended under the general name of nebulae and of which sir william and sir john herschel have catalogued above four thousand sir william herschel was enabled by the powers of his large reflecting telescope to divide and arrange the nebulous masses of light discovered by him in his general sweep of the northern heavens into the following six classes first distinct clusters of separate stars second resolvable nebulae or such as though not distinctly resolved yet clearly indicated that their resolution might be accomplished by more powerful optical instruments most of these have indeed now yielded to the powers of lord ross's gigantic six feet reflector third nebulae showing no trace of resolution in his sir william herschel's telescope in some of these also separate stars have been detected by lord ross's telescope and by the great refractor of the observatory at cambridge near boston united states and with every new increase in dimensions and power of our optical instruments we may expect to see these clouds of light more and more resolved 
into myriads upon myriads of separate stars. Fourth, planetary nebulae are such as have the appearance of planets. Fifth, stellar nebulae. And sixth, nebulous stars, which according to Sir John Herschel's definition, consist of a sharp and brilliant star, concentrically surrounded by a perfectly circular disk or atmosphere of faint light, in some cases dying away insensibly on all sides, in others almost suddenly terminated. This may also be the proper place to make a passing allusion to two most remarkable phenomena visible with the naked eye in southern latitudes, called the Magellanic Clouds. They are two cloudy masses of light of somewhat oval shape. When examined through powerful telescopes, they are found to be of astonishing complexity of constitution, the general ground of them consisting of large tracts and patches of nebulosity in every stage of resolution, and of clustering groups, interspersed with numerous nebulae, globular clusters in every stage of condensation, and objects of a nebulous character quite peculiar, and having no analogy in any other part of the heavens. What an inexhaustible field of speculation and conjecture is opened here to the imagination! The finite mind of man, with its limited comprehensive powers, is bewildered and lost in the interminable range of system upon system, firmament upon firmament, of stars, each of them a sun, and probably in its sphere the presiding centre round which planetary worlds may be revolving, the dwelling places, perchance, of intelligences of an immeasurably superior order to ours. The classification of stars into magnitudes by estimation of their relative brightness, although unquestionably much more rational than the unmeaning division into constellations, is, however, entirely arbitrary. As we can only judge of the brightness of a star by the total impression made by its light upon the eye, it is quite evident that the assumed magnitude will depend, first, on its distance from us, second, on the absolute extent of its illuminated surface, third, on the intrinsic brightness of that surface, and of these data we know nothing, or next to nothing. Up to a recent period, we only knew that the nearest fixed stars could not possibly be placed at a distance so small as 19 trillion 200 billion miles from the sun. But certain most admirable observations and measurings, made by the illustrious Bessel, have since clearly established the astounding fact that the fixed stars placed nearest to our solar system are distant from it some fifty-seven trillion miles, a distance utterly inconceivable by the human mind. Light travelling, as it is well known, at the rate of one hundred and ninety-two thousand miles per second, it will take a ray from the fixed stars nearest to us some nine and one-third years to reach the earth. But if this nearest and comparatively trifling distance is sufficient to appall the human understanding, what shall we say or think of the immeasurably greater distances which separate us from the remoter stars, and from the most distant visible nebulae, whose light, it has been calculated, will take at least a million years to reach our earth? To arrive at some approximate estimation of the real magnitude of the stars, the light which they shed on us, and the most imperfect and as yet still almost entirely negative knowledge which we have obtained, respecting their distances, must be our only guide. Now direct photometrical light measuring experiments have shown that the light of Sirius, the most brilliant of the fixed stars, is, at equal distances, one hundred and forty-six and a half times more intense than that of our sun, and that it would accordingly require a collection of more than one hundred and forty-six suns to shed a ray of light on our earth like that of Sirius supposing the two bodies to be placed at the same distance from us. To realize, however so feebly, the idea of the magnitude and intense luminosity of Sirius, we need simply reflect that the diameter of the sun is 885,000 miles, and that the light of the latter is about 800,000 times more intense and brilliant than that of the full moon. Several among the stars exhibit the most remarkable phenomenon of a regular periodical increase and diminution of luster, involving, in some rare instances, an alternate total extinction and revival. These are called periodical or variable stars. One of the most remarkable is the star Omicron, in the constellation Cetus, which has a period of 334 days. It remains about a fortnight at its greatest brightness, equal to a large star of the second magnitude. It then decreases during about three months until it disappears altogether. After remaining invisible during about five months, it reappears again, 
and continues increasing in brilliancy during the remaining three months of its period. It shows, however, occasionally considerable irregularity in its phases, and has actually been known on one occasion to remain altogether invisible during more than four years, between October 1672 and December 1676. Another remarkable specimen of a variable star is Beta in the constellation of Perseus. The whole period of change of this star is rather less than two days, twenty hours, and forty-nine minutes, during which time it varies in brightness from the second magnitude to the fourth. Its changes are confined, however, to a few hours, as it continues for rather more than two days, twelve hours, at its state of greatest brightness. Stars have also occasionally appeared suddenly in various parts of the heavens, blazing forth for a time with extraordinary luster, and after remaining a while apparently immovable, have gradually decreased in brightness and finally altogether vanished. These are properly termed temporary stars. Thus there suddenly appeared, in the time of Tycho Bray, 1572-11th November, in the constellation of Cassiopeia, a most lustrous star, equaling Sirius in brightness. It continued increasing in brilliancy up to December 1572, when it actually surpassed Jupiter and Venus when nearest to the Earth, and was visible at midday. From this period forward it began to diminish rapidly, and in March 1574 it had completely disappeared from the heavens. Another equally brilliant star burst forth on the 10th October 1604 in the constellation of Serpentarius, and continued visible till October 1605. The fact of the sudden appearance and subsequent disappearance of such temporary stars affords an irrefragable indication that there must exist also in space immense dark bodies, absolutely invisible to us, and of which accordingly we cannot possibly have any knowledge, as light is the only means of communication between the stars and the earth. There remains now for us still to consider another marvel of the heavens, the double and multiple stars. The telescope has revealed to us that several thousands of stars which appear single to the naked eye consist in reality of two or more luminous bodies placed in close proximity to each other. The observations and researches made principally by Sir William and Sir John Herschel, Sir James South, and the great Russian astronomer Struve have placed it beyond doubt that the proximity of these stars to each other is by no means accidental, but that they are physically connected together by the tie of gravity and revolve round each other as the planets do round the sun, and in obedience to the same law of attraction and gravitation which governs the motions of the solar system. Many of the double stars of unequal magnitude exhibit the beautiful phenomenon of complementary colors. Thus, if the larger star be of a ruddy or orange hue, the smaller one will appear blue or green. If the larger star appear yellow, the smaller will appear blue. If the light of the brighter star incline to crimson, that of the other will incline to green. In connection with this subject we may here remark that in many parts of the heavens isolated stars have been observed of a red color almost as deep as blood. Thus Arcturus, Aldebaran in Taurus, and Teres in the Scorpion are red stars, and what is more curious still, Sirius, whose light is now and has been for several centuries of the purest white, is mentioned by Ptolemy and all other astronomers of antiquity as a red star. Lyra, Cygnus, Corleonis, Virgo are white stars. Canis Minor, Aquila, the polar star, and the star Beta in Ursa Minor shed a yellow light. In certain nebulae, all the suns are of the same color, blue, for instance. Whilst in the nebulae of La Cale near the Southern Cross, powerful telescopes reveal to the delighted eye more than a hundred differently colored stars, red, green, blue, and of a greenish blue. Thus far have we winged our daring flight to the utmost confines of the visible heavens, to the ultima thule of the starry world. But beyond, into the endless realms of space, we may not soar. Here almighty wisdom has fixed a barrier, sealed to the finite intellect of man. The superior intelligences of higher spheres may perchance pass beyond into the immensity of God's creation, to stand in their turn on the confines of another immensity, into which even they may not enter and so on in endless succession. Verily, verily, inconceivable and ineffable is the magnitude of the works of the Almighty. A flight through space? No, no, not through space, I, not even yet, towards the threshold of space. End of chapter 13
Chapter Fourteen of the Fairy Tales of Science by John Cargill Brogue. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Tale of a Comet. I could a tale unfold. Hamlet. What I am, what I am made of. What class or family of celestial bodies do I belong to? How many there are of us? Where do we come from? Where are we going to? What offices do we perform? What purpose subserve in the great economy of the heavens? tell you all about us well you are inquisitive my little terrestrial friends and it appears to me a little overmuch so and small information i trow will get you out of me on most of these points still i cannot but admire the indomitable perseverance with which you are prying into the abyss of space seeking to fathom the secrets of the universe and although some of you have of late rather offended the dignity of the great family to which i belong denying us even the possession of anything like a substantial body calling us visible nothings affirming that they know all about us that they can look right through us and giving us somewhat plainly to understand that they regard us very much in the light of exploded humbugs i yet will bear no malice and will endeavour not indeed to satisfy your curiosity in all matters concerning me and my brethren but to give you some few scraps of information and stray hints about us leaving you to make the best use of them you may in your interminable cruise on the endless sea of speculation m babinet a distinguished french philosopher in his etude et lecture sur les sciences d'azuration is indeed rather hard upon the poor comets he calls them mere gatherings of vapour visible nothings devoid of all physical properties incapable of doing either good or harm and useful simply through enabling us to verify newton's law of attraction and explore the regions of heaven far beyond the limits of the solar system he says science now knows all about them and the public have ceased taking the least interest in them it would be interesting to know whether m babinet has since seen reason to modify this somewhat contemptuous opinion of those strange wanderers of the sky certain however it is that science confessedly knows as yet very little about comets and that the apparition and passes of donati's comet in eighteen fifty eight has been narrowly watched and tracked with the most eager curiosity and with the most lively interest well then i am one of a numerous family johannes kepler one of those bright intellectual stars that adorn and illumine your microscopic might of a sphere and render it interesting even to the giants of creation declared that there are more comets in space than fishes in the ocean a kindred spirit a kepler of the present age arago has calculated our number at some three and a half millions at the lowest computation and possibly twice as many we are of all sizes and magnitudes from the incredibly immense down to the minutest telescopic i myself may boast of a bulk exceeding that of the sun in the proportion of nearly three hundred to one that of your planet in the proportion of four hundred million to one my brother of eighteen eleven was still larger being about six hundred million times the bulk of your earth the essential part about us is the nucleus which sometimes appears as a bright stellar point and sometimes rather gives the notion of a planetary disk seen through a nebulous haze what is generally called our head is simply this nebulous haze which surrounds the nucleus the train of illuminated vapour which is often though by no means always attached to the head is usually termed by you the tail though allow me to observe rather improperly since this appendage often precedes us in our motions the inhabitants of that portion of your sphere which is designated in your maps by the name of china who though certainly a little pig-headed and strangely averse to progress in arts and sciences are yet very careful and moreover much more ancient observers of the starry heavens than you europeans have bestowed upon this occasional appendage the much more appropriate and significant name of brush or pencil of light the nebulous haze which invariably surrounds the nucleus of members of our family is called the coma from a greek word signifying hair some fancied resemblance of the nebulous matter composing this coma and the tail has gained us the name of comets or hairy stars now though rather put out by m babinet's most unceremonious and very unhandsome statement respecting the extreme flimsiness of our material structure i am yet bound to confess that there is unfortunately a great deal of truth in it leaving altogether out of the question the physical constitution of what is termed our tail which truly immeasurably exceeds in tenuity the atmosphere surrounding your earth 
I must even plead guilty to the charge of extreme lightheadedness brought against us. I would deny it if I could, but I know it would be of no use, as you are but too well aware that even the faintest stars can often be distinctly seen without any perceptible diminution of their lustre through the very centre of our heads, which, considering the enormous bulk, for instance, of my brother's head of 1811, exceeding that of your earth in the proportion of four million to one, most clearly shows that the matter composing it must possess an extreme degree of tenuity. If additional proof were required of this patent fact, it might be found in the almost imperceptible power of attraction which we, even of the largest magnitudes, exercise upon Jupiter and other planets, or even upon their satellites, and those still smaller atomic mites, the planetoids, when we accidentally cross them in our orbits. Jupiter, more especially, who seems to have a peculiar knack of being always, somehow or other, in the way of some of us, is not in the least affected by pretty near contact with our immense bulk, and actually often manages to thrust us right out of our orbits, a feat which even the wretched little planetoids, of whom myriads might find room in the head, millions in the tail, of one of us, have sometimes succeeded in performing. I would not, however, have you believe that we are mere visible nothings, the airy offspring of vapour and the sun. However so attenuated the material composing us may be, still it is ponderable matter, and there can be no doubt that in some of us, at least, the nucleus consists of a solid body of appreciable density, a direct collision with which it would not be overwise in any planet to court. Not that I want to frighten you about the possibility of such a collision with your earth. Your wise men have cleverly calculated that there are about three hundred million chances against a contingency of the kind. Moreover, depend upon it, none of us is likely ever to seek the chance of a brush against your earth or any other planet, and that for a sufficient reason of our own. You remember, perhaps, one of your very clever men, who, however, for all that, are by no means exempt from occasional mistakes, Mr. George Stevenson, whose genius has enabled you, poor little mites, to crawl at a somewhat less snaily pace than of old over the surface of your cheese, once said, in reply to a question addressed to him as to whether it might not be awkward if a cow were to happen to stray on a line of rails, right in the way of a rapidly advancing train, yes, very awkward for the cow. Experience has since, but too often and too clearly proved, that an event of the kind may be equally awkward for the train as for the cow, and we, who are much wiser in our generation, have really no notion of tempting the chances of a collision that might prove equally fatal to the two bodies. I may here briefly observe that the material of which we are composed is not luminous in itself, but it is illuminated by the sun of this, or in the case of those of us who soar into the immensity of space, some other solar system. We are most capricious and mutable in the forms which we assume, though, as a general rule, our heads mostly affect the globular or spheroidal shape. The magnificent luminous appendages or tails, which many of us proudly display, are sometimes straight and sometimes curved like a scimitar. With some of us this vapory train of light attains an immense apparent length. Thus, for instance, my brother comet of 1811, which, by the by, when first seen, possessed no visible tail, speedily threw out a luminous appendage covering some twenty-five degrees of heaven, or some one hundred and thirty million of miles. My own tail stretches some eleven degrees beyond this. That of my brother, of 371 B.C., Aristotle tells you, occupied some sixty degrees of the heavens. That of the comet of 1680 covered between seventy and ninety degrees, and that of the comet of 1618 is stated to have extended to one hundred and four degrees in length. Some of us exhibit more than one tail. My brother of 1744, for instance, had no less than six, spread out like an immense fan, extending to a distance of nearly thirty degrees in length. I have just now mentioned that my brother of 1811 was not at first provided with an appendage of luminous vapour. This is often the case with us. Thus the great comet of 1843 showed at its first appearance simply a nucleus, surrounded by a coma, but it speedily set about supplying the deficiency, and in less than twenty days managed to throw out a most magnificent tail, measuring two hundred millions of miles, which was generated, accordingly, at the rate of ten million miles a day, the matter composing it being propelled through space with a velocity of one hundred and fifteen miles per second, 
which is nearly six times that of the earth in its orbit and two hundred and fifty times greater than that of a cannon-ball you are already aware so i need hardly tell you that we are all of our family most eccentric in our motions to superficial observation we would indeed seem to be careening with mad capriciousness along the great highway of space but if you watch our motions more closely you will find that there is the strictest method in this apparent madness of our movements and that we obey the same universal law of attraction and gravitation as the other celestial bodies some of us moving about the sun in parabolic orbits or at least in ellipses of various degrees of eccentricity and returning in determinate periods in the same path unless disturbed others running off in hyperbolic orbits to visit other systems in the immensity of space we must here assume the reader to know that an ellipse whose major axis is of infinite length is said to degenerate into a parabola the parabola is a conic section which forms the limit between the ellipse on the one hand which returns into itself and the hyperbola on the other which runs out to infinity most of us come in fact into this solar system from parts of the universe extending to enormous distances beyond its limits and after approaching more or less near to the sun start off again on our journey to distances not less remote i may perhaps be permitted here to observe that with all due deference to m babinet and his somewhat contemptuous opinion of us and our uses i can safely affirm that we subserve some better and higher purpose in the great economy of the universe than enabling your astronomers to verify certain natural laws and to pry into the mysteries of heaven you will not of course expect me to tell you what these purposes may happen to be depend upon it you will find this out all in good time by the unaided efforts of that marvellous intelligence with which it has pleased the almighty to endow you this much however you may take for granted even now that we serve as a means of communication between system and system may it not be also that we serve to gather in our path the detritus of old worlds to be moulded hereafter into new spheres that we serve to carry to the suns of this and other systems the ardent fires with which we get impregnated in our passage near sirius and myriads of other suns that we serve to waft beings that have passed their probation from worlds immeasurably brighter than yours to spheres infinitely more glorious than theirs what a boundless field of speculation is open here to the human mind of exalted speculation such as may befit the grandeur of the subject and the vast intellectual powers of man and may henceforward take the place of the absurd notions of our influences for good or evil to which the superstitious feelings of mankind in the darker ages and even in more modern and enlightened times had given birth it seems hardly credible now that our apparition in the heavens should ever at any period of time have been almost universally regarded with feelings of awe and terror and that to us should have been ascribed the most malignant influences and a most astonishing diversity of effects physical physiological social and political and passing strange that even men like johannes kepler should not have been entirely free from this weakness seneca alone among ancient philosophers dare to oppose his powerful logic to the superstitious ideas which his age and the ages that had preceded it entertained with regard to our apparition in the heavens he that marvellous double and counterpart of the great british philosopher of a later period bacon equally wise equally mean declared that we moved regularly in orbits fixed by natural laws and expressed his conviction that posterity would one day stand aghast at the blindness of his age which could ignore or disregard facts so clear and palpable one of the brightest of our family so bright indeed as to be plainly visible in the daytime happening to make its appearance in the year of forty four or forty three b c a short time before or after the assassination of caesar was held to have if not actually brought about the death of the aspiring dictator at all events predicted or attended it as if the heavens would be likely to take an interest in the life and death of such a thing of blood and mire another comet the first whose orbit was calculated in sixteen eighty two by your illustrious edmund haley whose name it bears and will hand down to the remotest ages had at one of its former appearances in june fourteen fifty six spread terror throughout europe it was regarded as a most powerful ally of the turkish sultan mohammed the second who had taken constantinople and threatened to overrun christian europe 
with his victorious armies. Pope Calixtus II thought it high time to come to the aid of his sorely pressed flock, and launched the thunders of the Vatican against the celestial visitor, who thereupon, in due course of time, disappeared from the heavens. The Pope, in order to perpetuate this startling manifestation of the power of the Church, decreeing and ordaining the bells to be rung at noon, a custom observed to the present day in Catholic countries. What a curious commentary this doth afford on the infallibility which the bishops of Rome dare arrogate to themselves. Another of my brethren, the very one, in fact, whom you have been so anxiously expecting to reappear, ever since February 1848, but who, according to Baum's calculation, will only rejoice you some time about 1860, by a sight of his splendid dimensions, terrified the Emperor Charles V in 1556, into consummating the abdication of all his earthly crowns, and retirement to a monk's cell in the cloister of St. Justice in Spain, where he, who in the pride and arrogance of power, had sought, though vainly indeed, to make the millions who obeyed his sceptre conform to his own most narrow and bigoted religious creed, and in his presumptuous vanity had imagined that heaven's great lord had condescended to send a comet by way of special messenger to him, discovered, though unfortunately rather too late, that he could not even make two clocks strike alike, and at the same time, and felt humble to the dust thereat. But enough of these instances of presumption and folly of your kind, which yet are, perhaps, less insulting, after all, to the dignity of our family, than the notion that we occasionally take a delight in killing cats, as the splendid comet of 1668 was accused of doing in Westphalia, or blinding flies, destroying wasps, and cursing poor Whitechapel shoemakers with four babies at a birth, or destroying cities by an earthquake, knocking down steeple clocks in Scotland, and indulging in other undignified vagaries of the kind. I have some personal reason, if I may be allowed the expression, to take a special interest in the fair fame of the comet of 1668, as there would appear to be some chance that I may in the end turn out to be identical with that splendid object, to whom a period of sixteen years has been assigned, and whose last recorded appearance bears date 1843. Mind, I do not mean to assert anything positive about this matter, which resolves itself simply into a question of identity. I know that there is an individual of your species waiting for me now at the Cape of Good Hope, who will bring his powerful reflector and equally powerful intellect to bear upon me, and you may well afford to wait till next spring, when you will most probably learn from that quarter whether I am the real Simon Pure of 1668, with a period of sixteen years, or have a period of something like one hundred and fifty times as long. At all events, surely, where learned astronomers disagree, you would not ask a poor comet like me to decide. Even so recently as 1829, a most learned English medical practitioner, a Mr. T. Forster, made a fierce onslaught on the character of comets in general, to whom he ascribes all imaginable malignant influences, such as epidemic diseases of all kinds, earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, floods, droughts, and famines. Now, you may believe me, my little friends, we are entirely innocent of these dreadful charges brought against us, and I grieve to add, we cannot properly claim credit either for the glorious seasons that will occasionally coincide with our appearance, and for the splendid harvests of corn and wine produced therein. It would unquestionably have been a proud distinction for me to have had my name associated, as was that of my illustrious predecessor of 1811, with the wine of this most splendid and abundant year, 1858. But truth will not be trifled with. Careful statistical researches and comparisons of thermal and cometary observations, extending over a period of a century, have but too fully established the conclusion that we can claim no influence whatsoever on the temperature of the seasons. It is your Mr. Arago who has dealt us this heavy blow and great discouragement. I will now, in conclusion, add a few more words about some of the most remarkable of my brethren, whose periods have been fixed with more or less precision. The most remarkable of these is the great comet known by the name of Halley's, from the circumstance of that illustrious geometer, as has already been mentioned, having predicted its return. The immortal Newton, having demonstrated the possibility of any conic section whatever being described about the sun, by a body revolving under the dominion of the law of gravitation, applied his theory to the great comet of 1680 with the most complete success 
he ascertained that this comet described about the sun as its focus an elliptic orbit of such exceeding eccentricity as to degenerate into a parabola and that in this orbit the areas described about the sun were as in the planetary ellipses proportional to the times two years after in the year sixteen eighty two halley applied the principles of the newtonian theory to cometary bodies and calculated thereby the orbits of several ancient comets which led him to the discovery of a remarkable coincidence in the elements of the orbits of certain comets which had been observed at nearly equal intervals of time in fifteen thirty one sixteen o seven and sixteen eighty two after mature consideration he concluded that these comets must be identical returning at certain fixed periods and ventured to predict another return about the year seventeen fifty nine clairaut an eminent mathematician of the period undertook to calculate the delay which the return of this comet would experience from the disturbing influence exercised upon its orbit by the larger planets and fixed the return for spring seventeen fifty nine true to the appointment the comet made its reappearance on the twelfth of march of that year and once more seventy-six years after in october eighteen thirty five as had been calculated by several eminent mathematicians the great comet which appeared in sixteen eighty is supposed to have a period of five hundred and seventy five years and to be identical with the comet seen in eleven o five and five seventy five and also with that seen in forty four or forty three b c of which mention has already been made another great comet the one which as i have told you frightened poor charles v in fifteen sixty six and is expected to reappear in eighteen sixty is held to be identical with certain comets observed in one hundred four six hundred eighty three nine hundred seventy five and twelve hundred sixty four to which latter attaches the reputation of having presaged the death of pope urban the fourth who died on the second october just when that comet was making its last appearance in the heavens another again which appeared in sixteen sixty one is supposed to be the same as that seen in two hundred forty three eight hundred ninety one eleven hundred forty five fourteen hundred two and fifteen hundred thirty two the comet discovered by albers in eighteen fifteen in the constellation musca has a period of seventy-four years some of our family revolve in comparatively short periods round the sun one of the most remarkable of these is the one called Encke's comet so named from professor Encke of berlin who first ascertained its periodical return this comet revolves round the sun in the short period of three and one-third years it has been observed in seventeen eighty six seventeen ninety five eighteen o five eighteen eighteen and regularly ever after there being however a very strange and anomalous circumstance connected with it namely that its periods of revolution are found to be successively and equably shorter a circumstance which forebodes its ultimate fall into the sun unless it should previously be dissipated altogether a termination of its career by no means unlikely and to which many members of our family are liable another comet of short period is the one called after mr biela of josephstad who at its apparition in eighteen twenty six identified it with comets that had appeared in seventeen seventy two and eighteen o five the time of its revolution is about six and two-third years it has since been observed in eighteen thirty two eighteen thirty nine eighteen forty five six and eighteen fifty two in the last two years as a double comet at the return of biela's comet in eighteen forty five and six a most singular phenomenon was observed the comet appeared at first as usual as a single body but on its approach towards perihelion it was on the thirteenth january eighteen forty six for the first time seen to be attended by another comet considerably fainter at a distance of about two feet this distance continued steadily to increase with a corresponding change in the comparative brightness of the two comets till the companion comet became as bright as the original and subsequently brighter exhibiting a star-like nucleus a very short time after however the original comet gained again in brilliancy on its companion which finally disappeared some time before the other ceased to be observed a comet discovered by m fay in eighteen forty three describes an elliptic orbit in a period of seven and a half years and has been observed on its return in eighteen fifty two other comets the one discovered by de vico in eighteen forty four the other by brorsen in eighteen forty six 
have each a period of about five and one-half years. Another, finally, discovered by Darest in 1851, in the constellation Pisces, has a period of seven years. Before I take my final leave of you, I may still mention that, though now universally known as Donati's Comet, Professor Donati of Florence, enjoying the credit and reputation of having cited me first, on the 2nd June, 1858, a reclamation has been put in by Dr. Vinica of Bonn, who declares having discovered me as early as the ninth March, and by Father Nesselhuber, director of the Kremsmunster Observatory, who professes to have seen me in the constellation Aquila on the 19th March. Dr. Bruns of Berlin has calculated that I complete my revolution round the sun in an eccentric ellipse in a period of 2,100 years. My greatest distance from the sun, which it will take me 1,050 years to reach, being about 31,506,000,000 miles. And now, farewell till our next meeting. Methinks I hear you exclaim that this is scant and meagre information indeed. Patience, my little friends, at my next appearance, whenever that may be, I trust I may be in a position to tell a different and more circumstantial and satisfactory tale of a comet. End of chapter 14《Chapter Fifteen of the Fairy Tales of Science by John Cargill Brug. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Invisible World. Nor is the stream of purest crystal, nor the lucid air, though one transparent vacancy it seems, void of their unseen people. Thompson. The revelations of the telescope are not more astounding than those of the microscope. The human eye can only range over a finite portion of the universe, but aided by these magic instruments its sphere of research is greatly augmented. The one familiarizes the mind with the rolling orbs of the infinitely distant world, while the other enables us to examine the marvelous inhabitants of that which is infinitely minute. Single microscopes in the form of glass globes containing water were used by the ancients, and in course of time these crystal bubbles gave place to hemispheres of glass, and these in their turn to lenses. The term microscope is derived from two Greek words, the first signifying a small object, while the latter to see or examine. The compound microscope, consisting of two lenses placed at a distance, so that the one next the eye magnifies the enlarged image of any object placed in front of the other, was invented by a spectacle maker at Middleburg in Holland, about the year 1590. This Dutch microscope, rudely formed of two lenses and a wooden tube, was the germ of the beautiful and complex instrument of modern times. Let us now peep through this wondrous spyglass into the invisible world. In a single drop of stagnant water we may discover a world of marvelous creatures, whose eccentric forms baffle description. In some of these tiny monsters it is not easy to detect any definite shape, as their bodies are destitute of any solid support, and seem to be composed of gelatinous matter, which may take almost any figure. In others there is still a considerable variety in the forms assumed by the same individual under different circumstances, but the prevailing shape can be recognized. In others, again, the body, although still unprotected by any firm envelope, appears to undergo little change in figure, except when affected by temporary pressure but there are many that cannot be influenced even by pressure, their soft bodies being enclosed in coats of flinty mail. All these creatures move about in the water with great rapidity, yet they have neither arms, legs, nor fins. Their movements are performed by means of peculiar processes called cilia, which resemble minute hairs. So active are these cilia, and such restless little fellows are those to whom they belong, that it is impossible to conceive a more animated scene than that presented to the eye of the microscopic observer in the examination of a drop of water. The waters of the earth teem with these minute forms of existence, but as their presence was first detected in certain infusions of vegetable matter, they were named infusoria, a term which they have been allowed to retain, though it is now known that their sphere of existence embraces all the aqueous portions of the globe. We have said that their quaint forms baffle description, but we will endeavor to give the reader some idea, however inadequate, of one or two individuals of the infusorial race. The smallest and the most active members of this immense family are the monads, which so thickly populate the invisible world 
that Ehrenberg has declared that a selected drop of water may actually contain as many as there are human beings upon the surface of the great globe itself. These minute creatures are always in motion, and may be seen bustling about in every part of the drop, to them a mighty sea, as though their health and happiness depended on constant exercise. The little creatures, or rather the congeries of creatures, called the volvox, and formerly known as the globe animacule, is not the least remarkable of this group. It consists of a number of monads, invested by a common envelope, each individual maintaining in some mysterious way an organic connection with its companions. It is not easy to understand how a number of distinct beings can move in such perfect unison as to be frequently mistaken for a single animalcule. Yet so it is. This group of monads rolls round and round the drop of water with the peculiar revolving or spinning movement which has given rise to its distinctive appellation of volvox, just as if it were a single being. Six or eight young volvices may generally be seen through the transparent envelope, from which they make their escape when sufficiently developed to become the envelopes of new broods. The rotifera form a class even more interesting than the monads. The animals of this class have usually an elongated form, and are perfectly symmetrical on the two sides. Near the mouth we observe one or two rows of delicate cilia, which are frequently arranged in a circular manner, and when they are in motion an appearance of revolving wheels is produced, from which the class derives its appellation. The common wheel animacule was long a puzzle to philosophers, who were forced to invent many marvellous hypotheses to explain the motion of the pair of paddle wheels with which this little creature is furnished. We must not always believe our own eyes, for the two little wheels on the anterior part of the body of this rotifer, which seem to be always turning round on their axes, are really stationary. The motion is now allowed to be an optical illusion, produced by the motion of the two circular rows of cilia on the forepart of the body. These cilia lash the surrounding waters into a miniature whirlpool, into which innumerable animacules are drawn, to be swallowed by the voracious rotifer, who is provided with a formidable set of crushing teeth, and a most efficient digestive apparatus. The movements of these strange animals are active and varied. Sometimes they will attach themselves by the tail to a fixed object, and set their cilia in motion to entrap unwary monads. Then they will pack up their wheels and swim freely through the water, or crawl along a solid surface, after the manner of a leech. Some of the rotifera may be completely dried up and preserved for an indefinite time, without the loss of their vitality but put one of these withered animacules in water, and in an hour's time you will see him return to life, though he may have been apparently dead for many years. The multiplication of the rotifera is extremely rapid, twenty-four hours being a sufficient period for an individual to be born, be developed, and to become itself a parent. The reader must not forget that all these wonderful facts are related of a living being not quite the thirty-sixth part of an inch in length a mere speck in the visible world. Let us pause for a moment in our examination to reflect upon these marvellous revelations. How perfect are the works of the divine hand! Not long since we allowed our imagination to penetrate the unfathomable ocean of space, wherein God's name is written worlds, and now, as we peep into a drop of water, we find in the structure of its marvellous inhabitants evidences of the same almighty wisdom that conceived the harmonious arrangement of the celestial orbs. It has been truly said that the smallest living object in the world is in itself, and for the part it is destined to perform in nature, as perfect as the largest. The plants of the invisible world outvie the animals in strangeness and beauty. We call them plants, though they are utterly unlike the vegetable forms of the visible world. All these beings are endowed with powers of motion, and were until recently regarded as animals. In nature, there is no line of demarcation between the two organic kingdoms, and these moving plants seem to form the link which renders the chain of being complete. The diatomaceae, or diatoms, are by far the most abundant forms of microscopic vegetation, and we will therefore devote some space to their consideration. In shape, these beings resemble mathematical figures of minute dimensions, rather than vegetable organisms, and appear to us as living circles, ovals, polygons, triangles, and stars. The movements of the diatoms are due to the cilia, or eyelashes, with which they are furnished, but it is a disputed point whether these cilia act in obedience to a will 
or whether their motion is due to a physical force acting independently of any controlling power. Adopting the latter view of ciliary motion, a clever writer has compared the moving diatom to a little steamer, with the fires lighted and the paddles going, but without a crew, a pilot, or a captain. The distinguishing peculiarity of the diatomaceae is that they possess a solid framework of flint, their vegetable matter being merely a delicate investing membrane. The trees of the forest, having passed through their successive stages of development, undergo the process of decay, their constituents being dissipated as invisible gases. But the tiny diatoms are indestructible, and their constantly accumulating skeletons are gradually being deposited in beds beneath the waters which cover three-fifths of the surface of this planet. At first, says a celebrated naturalist, Dr. Harvey, the effect produced by things so small, thousands of which may be contained in a drop, and millions packed together in a cubic inch, may appear a trifling moment, when speaking of so grand an operation as the deposition of submarine strata. But each moment has its value in the measurement of time, to whatever extent of ages the succession may be prolonged, so each of these atoms has a definite relation to space, and their constant production and deposition will at length result in mountains. The examination of the most ancient of the stratified rocks, and of all others in the ascending scale, and the investigation of deposits now in the course of formation, teach us that, from the first dawn of animated nature up to the present hour, this prolific family has never ceased its activity. England may boast that the sun never sets upon her empire, but here is an ocean realm whose subjects are literally more numerous than the sands of the sea. We cannot count them by millions simply, but by hundreds of thousands of millions. Indeed, it is futile to speak of numbers in relation to things so uncountable. Extensive rocky strata, chains of hills, beds of marl, almost every description of soil, whether superficial or raised from a great depth, contain the remains of these little plants, in greater or less abundance. Some tracts of country are literally built up of their skeletons. No country is destitute of such monuments, and in some they constitute the leading features in the structure of the soil. The world is a vast catacomb of diatomaceae, nor is the growth of these old dwellers on the earth diminished in its latter days. Whether living or dead, diatoms are very beautiful objects under the microscope but it is impossible to give in words a distinct idea of their complex forms and delicate markings. In the muddy waters of the Thames we meet with some lovely varieties. Amongst them we may find one or two which may be roughly compared with some familiar objects belonging to the visible world. A many-spoked wheel, divested of its felly, will give the reader some idea of a common diatom, the Asterionella, but he must imagine the spokes to be formed of innumerable pieces joined together with the utmost nicety, and to be inserted in the nave with far greater regularity than that attainable by any human wheelwright. Yet this delicate wheel is formed of the hardest flint, and is so minute that its spokes are less than the three hundredth part of an inch in length. Another diatom, Fragilaria, has the appearance of a piece of lace edging, with crossing threads and oval openings arranged in a beautiful and perfectly regular pattern. Another, the basilaria, resembles a chain of flat beads, or rather, an open bracelet formed of oblong tablets. This simile, however, is far from being perfect, for the living tablets of the diatom are neither strung upon threads nor connected by hinges, but are joined in some inexplicable manner at their corners. The boat-shaped diatoms, or naviculae, are perhaps the most beautiful of this minute family. One of them, an unnamed variety, has been thus described by an anonymous writer. The tiny bark is a boat of cut-rock crystal, fit to float across the sea of light. Itself might also be believed to be fashioned out of solidified light. The central line must be the keel, the translucent planking is clearly visible, and round the sides are cut symmetrical notches to serve as relics for ethereal rowers to navigate this brilliant gondola. In Thames water, naviculae exist in great abundance, the most common form being that of an Indian canoe, with a graceful curved prow, the navicula hippocampus. The flint which forms the skeleton of the diatom, and the armor of the animacule, is withdrawn from its solution in the waters inhabited by these minute organisms by some mysterious operation of the vital force. 
so prolific are these tiny forms of life that it has been estimated that a single animalcule can increase to such an extent during one month that its entire descendants can form a bed of silica or flint twenty-five square miles in extent and one foot and three-quarters thick as a parallel to archimedes says bischoff who declared he could move the earth if he had a lever long enough we may say give us a mailed animalcule and with it we will in a short time separate all the carbonate of lime and silica from the ocean this leads us to consider more minutely the part played by the animals and plants of the invisible world in the formation of the beds of rock which form the solid crust of our globe twenty years ago professor ehrenberg discovered a wonderful bed of earth which was almost entirely composed of living infusoria and which extended to twenty and in some localities even to sixty feet in depth this formation is situated in berlin at a depth of about fifteen feet below the pavement of the city how life is sustained in this subterranean world of infusoria is a mystery since it is evident that the organisms cannot come in contact with any air except that which is contained in the water which percolates through the mass this discovery was followed by others equally astounding a mass more than twenty feet in thickness of light siliceous earth was found at epsdorf in hanover and on examination by the microscope it appeared that this earth consisted entirely of the minute shields of invisible infusoria again the beds of siliceous marls upon which the towns of richmond and petersburg in virginia are built are now known to be almost wholly made up of the skeletons of diatomaceae the forms that predominate are elegant saucer-shaped shields elaborately ornamented with hexagonal spots disposed in curves and resembling the engine turned sculpting on a watch they vary in size from the one hundredth to the one thousandth of an inch in diameter as reported by dr mantell we need not carry our microscope out of england to discover the remains of infusoria in the earth's crust the white chalk which underlies or forms the surface of the southeastern part of england is a mere aggregation of microscopic shell and corals so minute that upwards of a million of the former are contained in a single cubic inch of this well-known substance these little shells which remind us of those of the nautili are the calcareous envelopes of the animalcules termed foraminifera which abound in modern seas and are constantly contributing to the amount of sediment now forming in the bed of the ocean the beautiful white stone called calcaire grossière which furnishes the inhabitants of paris with a cheap and inexhaustible supply of building material has almost the same structure as chalk and professor anstead has observed that the capital of france as well as the towns and villages of the neighboring departments are almost entirely built of foraminifera these stupendous results produced by the agency of creatures that are separately invisible to the naked eye direct our thoughts to the creator who has thought fit to endow these living atoms with powers that render them such important instruments in effecting the changes in the earth's surface which his infinite wisdom has planned let us quit the infusoria and glance with our microscopic eye at some other marvellous objects belonging to the invisible world if we look through our magic tube at the downy mould formed on any decaying substance a wonderful forest of delicate thread-like plants will be revealed these beautiful fungi will be seen to multiply and grow to swell and finally to burst scattering their invisible spores into the surrounding air if we make use of our microscope to examine the eggs of insects we shall have cause to wonder at their elaborate carving and beautiful forms it is impossible to convey to the reader an adequate idea of the elegant design and delicate sculpturing of some of these insect eggs few of which be it observed are what is commonly termed egg-shaped it is impossible to account for the strange diversities of form in these egglets thus in the small and great peacock butterflies which differ in little but size the egg of the first is a cylinder with eight prominent ribs while that of the latter is shaped like a florence flask and has no ribs why the little peacock should escape from a barrel and the big one from a bottle is a problem as yet unsolved here are the eggs of four different members of the butterfly family to the unaided eye they appear mere uninteresting dots about the size of a pin's head but if we examine them microscopically we shall find that nature has spared no pains in decorating these minute objects one of these eggs is an elegant turban 
having a round button in the center of the depressed crown. Another is a very elaborate pound cake. The third, a fairy football, covered with a network of extremely minute hexagonal meshes. And the fourth is a little spherical summer house of rustic work roofed with flat tiles. The last simile is a little strained, as it is not easy to imagine a rustic arbor shaped like a balloon. But we must remind the reader that we meet with forms in the invisible world that cannot be likened to any object that exists within the sphere of unaided vision. The smaller insects deposit eggs that are still more curious than those of the butterflies and moths. The egg of the lace fly is like an unripe cherry with a long white transparent stem, that of the blow fly like a white cucumber with longitudinal stripes, and that deposited by the bug has been well compared to a circular game pie with a standing crust, the lid of which is lifted when the young one makes its exit after hatching. The microscope reveals many wonderful peculiarities of structure in the beings whose eggs we have just examined. The colored dust of the butterfly's wing turns out to be feathery scales of a tapering form, with deeply cut notches at their broad end. The hairs of the bee are seen to be thickly beset with still finer hairs. The smallest fly is found to possess an elaborate pumping apparatus or trunk, compared with which the pumps constructed by man are clumsy and inefficient. The eyes of insects are composite, each visible eye being made up of thousands that are invisible. No less than 20,000 of these minute organs have been detected by means of the microscope in the head of the hawk moth. But our space is limited, and we dare not enter any further into the subject of insect anatomy. The dust of the butterfly's wing is remarkable enough, but the fertilizing dust or pollen that covers the stamens of flowers appears still more curious to the microscopic eye. Pollen varies greatly in different plants. An author, who seems to have a happy knack of finding similes for indescribable objects, says that the rose and poppy have pollen-like grains of wheat, magnified into semi-transparent weaver's shuttles. That of the mallow, he tells us, resembles cannonballs covered with spikes. The fuchsia has pollen like bits of half-melted sticky sugar candy, with which a small quantity of horsehair has become entangled. And the passion flower has pollen grains resembling Chinese carved ivory balls. The microscope has revealed strange little fissures and cavities in minerals, the latter containing fluids, groups of crystals, and floating balls. Even the diamond, topaz, garnet, and other precious stones have these minute cavities. Here we must stop, or our fairy tale will wear out the patience of the reader. We have glanced at a few of the marvels of the invisible world through that wonderful spyglass which science has recently brought to a high state of perfection, and which day by day adds to our knowledge of minute things. Our examination has necessarily been imperfect, for it would be an easier task to enumerate all the visible objects upon the face of the earth than to describe the countless forms that exist in the invisible world. End of chapter 15「Chapter sixteen of the Fairy Tales of Science by John Cargill Brogue. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Wonderful plants. Give me to drain the cocoa's milky bowl, and from the palm to draw its refreshing wine. Thompson. The wonderful plants portrayed by our artist are scarcely more wonderful than some of the vegetable productions of this bounteous earth. The little boy may well be astonished to see such a wonderful crop of good things, but if he will only stop and think a little, he will find that plum puddings, mince pies, and wearing apparel do really grow, or, more strictly speaking, they spring from the wonderful plants which actually exist. Consider the composition of that famous pudding, which crowns the fanciful group of the preceding page, the currants and raisins, the sugar, almonds, and candied lemon peel, which are its principal ingredients, are all vegetable productions, and the suet and eggs may be described as animalized grass and barley, for they are formed out of the vegetable food of the ox and the hen. The plum pudding tree is not half so preposterous a conception as it appears to be at the first glance. In the present chapter we propose to consider some of the most striking productions of the vegetable kingdom. We shall not attempt to preserve any sort of order in our rapid review, but will jump from one country to another, 
and throw aside all the elaborate systems of classification that have been devised by botanists. We will promise to bring some wonderful plants before the reader's notice, but we will not bind ourselves to any scientific rules. The imaginary plum pudding tree naturally suggests the breadfruit of the islands of the Pacific, that wonderful plant that bears a crop of penny rolls. The breadfruit is a beautiful as well as a useful tree. Its trunk rises to a height of about forty feet, and when full grown, is from a foot to fifteen inches in diameter. The branches come out in a horizontal manner, becoming shorter and shorter as they near the top. The leaves are of a rich green, are nearly two feet long, and deeply gashed or divided at the edges. As for its marvelous fruit, we cannot do better than quote the words of Captain Dampier, who first described it in 1668. The fruit, says this celebrated navigator, grows on the boughs like apples. It is as big as a penny loaf when wheat is at five shillings the bushel. It is of a round shape and hath a thick, tough rind. When the fruit is ripe, it is yellow and soft, and the taste is sweet and pleasant. The natives use it for bread. They gather it when full grown, while it is green and hard. Then they bake it in an oven which scorcheth the rind and maketh it black. But they scrape off the outside black crust, and there remains a tender, thin crust, and the inside is soft, tender, and white, like the crumb of a penny loaf. There is neither seed nor stone in the inside, but all of a pure substance like bread. It must be eaten now, for if it be kept above twenty-four hours, it grows harsh and choky, but it is very pleasant before it is too stale. This fruit lasts in season eight months in the year, during which the natives eat no other sort of bread. This quaint description is singularly accurate, and has been confirmed by many modern travellers. The timber of the breadfruit, though soft, is much used by the natives in the construction of houses and boats. The flowers, when dried, form a sort of tinder. The viscous fluid that oozes from the trunk serves for bird lime and glue. The leaves are used for towels, and from the inner bark a coarse kind of cloth is made. Thus we see that food and raiment grow on this wonderful plant. The cabbage palm of Suriname is another of our wonderful plants. This gigantic tree has a stem about seven feet in circumference at the base, which ascends straight and tapering to a vast height, and bears a plume of graceful foliage. The cabbage lies concealed within the leaves that surround the top of the trunk. It is about two or three feet long, and as thick as a man's arm. When eaten raw, it greatly resembles the almond in flavor, but is much more tender and delicious. It is generally cut into pieces, boiled, and served up with meat. To obtain this small portion, says Dr. Lancaster, born on the pinnacle of the tree, and hidden from the eye of man, the axe is applied to the stately trunk, and this majestic lord of the mountain top is laid low to furnish a small quantity of vegetable matter, which is eaten like cauliflower, and which receives its distinctive name from our lowly cabbage. Surely this rivals the tales handed down to us of Roman epicurism. The reader has doubtless heard of the cow tree of South America, which yields an abundant supply of milk to the Indian of the Cordilleras, and flourishes at a vast height amid the mountains where no cattle can pasture. This wonderful plant has been described by Humboldt with his characteristic spirit and accuracy. On the side of a thirsty rock, says the great traveller, grows a tree whose leaves are dry and husky. Its large roots penetrate with difficulty through the stony soil. During many months of the year not a shower waters its foliage. The branches appear withered and dead, but when its trunk is pierced a sweet and nourishing milk flows from the wound. It is at the rising of the sun that this vegetable aliment is most plentiful. The natives and the black slaves then gather together from all parts with large wooden vessels to catch the milk, which as it flows becomes yellow and thickens on the surface. Some make their abundant meal at the foot of the tree which supplies it. Others carry their full vessels home to their children. Our reader will not question the utility of writing paper, though he may possibly deem this substance of inferior importance to either bread, cabbage, or milk. The poets and sages of antiquity did not write their immortal works upon foolscap, but upon natural paper, furnished by the papyrus, a reed-like plant, growing in the waters of the Nile. The stem of this wonderful plant is triangular, and shoots up gracefully to the height of some fifteen or twenty feet, its slender top bearing a tuft of thread-like leaves. 
the inner bark of the stem was divided into thin plates or pellicles, each as large as the plant would admit. These plates, which were necessarily very narrow, were then laid side by side, with their edges touching, on a smooth hard surface, and then other pieces were laid across them, so as to form a sheet of many pieces, which required adhesion to become one united substance. The whole was then moistened with Nile water, and subjected to pressure, and in this manner the sheet was formed, for the glutinous sap contained in the plant sufficed to cement the various pieces together. The plates procured from the central portions of the stem were the most valuable, and were used to form varieties of paper equivalent to our cream-laid and satin-wove post. The papyrus must look down upon its aquatic companions with supreme contempt, for it can boast of a long line of ancestors, whose delicate underskins serve to perpetuate the sublime thoughts conceived by the giant intellects of the past. The fan palm of Ceylon is another paper tree. Its stem attains a great height, and is surmounted by many large palmated leaves, the lobes or divisions of which are very long, and are arranged round a footstalk like the ribs of an umbrella. Indeed, these compound leaves are actually used as umbrellas by the Singalese, a single outspreading leaf affording ample shelter for seven or eight people. All the religious books of the Singalese are written, or rather engraved, on tablets plucked from this wonderful palm, the leaves of the book being simply the leaflets of the tree. The palms are all wonderful plants, from whatever point of view we may regard them. The services they render man are incalculable. The date palm gives him its nourishing fruit, the cocoa palm its milky nuts, the sago palm its farinaceous pith, and the palmyra palm its sweet juice which becomes wine by fermentation. Then, as for useful things that are neither eatable nor drinkable, the palm tribe furnishes vegetable oil, wax, and ivory, fibers that may be formed into cordage, leaves that may be used for thatching, and timber that may be applied to a hundred different purposes. The wax-bearing palm is called the Pasiuba, and its peculiar form, were it remarkable for nothing else, would entitle it to a place among our wonderful plants. Its slender stem shoots up to the height of some fifty or sixty feet, and is strangely supported by a tall open cone of roots. Wallace, in his Palms of the Amazon, describes these palms thus. But what most strikes attention in this tree, and renders it so peculiar, is that the roots are almost entirely above ground. They spring out from the stem, each one at a higher point than the last, and extend diagonally downwards till they approach the ground when they often divide into many rootlets, each of which secures itself in the soil. As fresh ones spring out from the stem, those below become rotten and die off, and it is not an uncommon thing to see a lofty tree supported entirely by three or four roots, so that a person may walk erect beneath them, or stand with a tree seventy feet high growing immediately over his head. In the forest where these trees grow, numbers of young plants of every age may be seen, all miniature copies of their parents, except that they seldom possess more than three legs, which give them a strange and most ludicrous appearance. These aerial roots are not peculiar to the Pasiuba palm. In the mangrove, a wonderful plant that grows on the seashore in tropical countries, the trunk springs from the union of a number of slender arches formed by the roots, whose extremities penetrate into the muddy soil. The larger arches, says Mr. Goss, send out secondary shoots from their sides, which take the same curved form, but in a direction at right angles to the former, and thus a complex array of vaulted lines is formed, which to the crabs that run beneath, if they were able to institute the comparison, might be like the roof groins of some Gothic church, supposing the interspaces to be open to the sky. But the wonder of wonders in this shore-loving plant is the premature germination of its long, club-shaped seeds. Each seed begins to grow while hanging from the twig, gradually lengthening until the tip reaches the soft soil, which it penetrates, and thus roots itself. The seeds which depend from the higher branches cannot stretch themselves out to a sufficient length to reach the mud. They therefore drop as soon as they feel themselves strong enough to commence an independent existence. In this manner, a dense forest of mangroves is speedily produced from a single trunk. Dampier has described such a forest with his usual accuracy. The red mangrove, he says, 
groweth commonly by the seaside or by rivers or creeks it always grows out of many roots but with the bigness of a man's leg some bigger some less which at about six eight or ten feet above the ground join into one trunk or body that seems to be supported by so many artificial stakes where this sort of tree grows it is impossible to march by reason of these stakes which grow so mixed one among the other that i have when forced to go through them gone half a mile and never set my foot on the ground stepping from root to root there is a species of cane that must surely be considered a wonderful plant for though no thicker than the little finger it is sometimes a quarter of a mile in length this vegetable cord is studded with sharp prickles by means of which it is enabled to cling to the leaves and branches of the various trees which it encounters in its serpentine course the gum trees of the australian forests resemble our own timber trees in form but their leaves instead of being extended horizontally so as to catch the falling rain are placed edgewise and thus allow the raindrops and the sun's rays to pass between them near these wonderful trees which afford no shelter may be found the grass tree displaying what seems to be an immense tuft of wiry grass elevated on the summit of a dark ungainly trunk a number of tall spikes of blossom resembling bulrushes spring from the centre of the grassy crown and render this wonderful plant still more anomalous the famous banyan tree must not be omitted for it would be difficult to find a plant to which the epithet wonderful could be applied with greater propriety this sacred tree of the hindus attains a prodigious size sometimes covering an area of nearly two thousand square yards for its lateral branches send down shoots which take root till in course of time a single tree becomes a vast umbrageous tent supported by numerous columns the poet has thus described this marvel of the vegetable kingdom branching so broad along that in the ground the bending twigs take root and daughters grow about the mother tree a pillared shade high over arched with echoing walks between there oft the indian herdsman shunning heat shelters in cool and tends his pasturing herds at loopholes cut through the thickest shade turn we now to plants much smaller but not less wonderful than those we have mentioned the mean-looking little plant called the fly-trap of venus is gifted with sensation which compensates for its want of beauty each leaf is formed into two halves which move on a central hinge and fold up and contract on the slightest contact the edges are beset with spines and the whole surface is covered with a sticky mucilage no sooner does an unfortunate fly alight on one of these ticklish leaves than the two halves spring together and the insect is made a prisoner there are other irritable plants which ought to be mentioned here the leaves of the sensitive mimosa shrink from the slightest touch while those of the hedocerum gyrans have a spontaneous motion and appear to dance about from pure buoyancy of spirits the pitcher plant with its marvellous lidded goblet is another member of the class wonderful so is the caricature plant whose spotted leaves bear such a striking resemblance to human faces the orchids whose flowers mimic the forms of various insects and the cacti whose quaint shapes render them so remarkable ought to be included in our review of wonderful plants but this list must necessarily be imperfect as the wonders of the vegetable world are innumerable we have merely selected a few striking forms of vegetable life to show the reader that botany as well as other sciences has its marvels but are not all plants wonderful if we examine minutely the structure of the humblest moss we may discover wonders which fill the mind with admiration and astonishment we may fitly conclude this rambling chapter with an anecdote related by one of the earliest african explorers who found consolation when in the depth of misery in the contemplation of one of the wonderful plants with which the creator has been pleased to deck this beautiful earth in this forlorn and almost helpless condition writes mungo park when the robbers had left me i sat for some time looking around me with amazement and terror whatever way i turned nothing appeared but danger and difficulty i found myself in the midst of a vast wilderness in the depths of the rainy season naked and alone surrounded by savage animals and by men still more savage i was five hundred miles from any european settlement all these circumstances crowded at once on my recollection and i confess that my spirits began to fail me i considered my fate as certain 
and that I had no alternative but to lie down and perish. The influence of religion, however, aided and supported me. I reflected that no human prudence or foresight could possibly have averted my present sufferings. I was indeed a stranger in a strange land, yet I was still under the protecting eye of that God who has condescended to call himself the stranger's friend. At this moment, painful as my reflections were, the extraordinary beauty of a small moss caught my eye, and though the whole plant was not larger than the top of one of my fingers, I could not contemplate the delicate conformation of its roots, leaves, and fruit without admiration. Can that being, thought I, who planted, watered, and brought to perfection in this obscure part of the world, a thing which appears of so small importance, look with unconcern upon the situation and sufferings of creatures formed after his own image? Surely not. Reflections like these would not allow me to despair. I started up, and disregarding both hunger and fatigue, travelled onwards, assured that relief was at hand, and I was not disappointed. End of chapter 16「Chapter Seventeen of the Fairy Tales of Science by John Cargill Brogue. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Moving Lands The ice is here, the ice is there, the ice is all around. It cracks and growls and roars and howls like noises in a swound. The attention of scientific men has of late been directed to the structure and movement of glaciers, those vast accumulations of ice that fill up the deep valleys of mountains whose summits are covered by perpetual snow. These glaciers form the moving lands which we are about to consider for the edification of our reader. The facts that we have to bring forward relating to these gigantic icicles will doubtless be new to the majority of our readers, as they have not yet found their way into elementary scientific treatises. In selecting our fairy tales from the copious budget of science, we have never lost sight of novelty, but have endeavored to elucidate the most recent discoveries. As we ascend a lofty mountain, the air becomes colder and colder, and at a certain elevation we enter the regions of eternal snow. The vegetation that clothes the slopes undergoes a corresponding change, and at the margin of the snow we find plants resembling those of the Arctic Circle. In the upper regions of the ice world, water descends from the clouds in the form of snow, but never in the form of rain. The average fall of snow in the region of the Swiss Alps, from 8,000 to 10,000 feet above the level of the sea, has been estimated at 60 feet, that is to say, sufficient snow descends in one year to form a bed of this thickness. What becomes of all this frozen water? How is it that the mountains do not become top-heavy? Be patient, gentle reader. We shall be in a position to answer these momentous questions soon, but at present we must confine our attention to the structure of the snowbeds that are formed on the vast tablelands of these elevated regions. The snowbed is generally called the neve, and is formed of layers of more or less crystalline snow, which diminish in thickness as their depth increases. In other words, each layer is thinner than that immediately above it. At a certain depth these layers can scarcely be distinguished one from another, and still lower the substance of the neve passes into clear ice. The separate layers represent each considerable fall of snow that has taken place, and their gradual consolidation arises from the percolation of water coming from above, and the pressure of fresh strata of snow which continually accumulate overhead. The deep valleys that radiate from the central mass of a great mountain are invariably filled with frozen water and are the outlets of the frozen snowfields, or, in the words of a clever writer, the glacier is a river of ice, and the neve its source. Glaciers sometimes fill up a valley twenty miles long by three or four broad to the depth of six hundred feet. Although apparently solid and stationary, they really move slowly down the valley, and carry with them, either on the surface frozen into their mass, or grinding and rubbing along the bottom, all the fragments, large and small, from blocks many tons in weight, down to the finest sand and mud, that rain and ice and the friction of the moving glacier itself detach from the adjacent rocks. The glaciers of the Alps, and probably those of other regions, descend to a vertical depth of nearly 4,000 feet below the line of perpetual snow, and into a climate much warmer than that of our own island, before they finally melt away, and leap forth as rivers of running water. 
the heap of materials of all sorts and sizes which they deposit at their melting extremity is called the moraine a term which is also applied to the lines of blocks that are being carried along the surface of the glacier the floating sticks and straws of the solid river strange to say the simple fact of the motion of glaciers was not admitted until a comparatively recent date though it was well known that the lower end of a glacier in spite of its rapid thawing remained year after year at about the same point were we to attempt to describe the various observations that have been made with a view to determine the rate of glacial movement we fear we should tax our readers patience let us mention one or two illustrative facts in the year eighteen twenty seven m hugui built a very solid hut on the glacier of the lower r in eighteen thirty six this hut was four thousand three hundred and eighty four feet farther down the valley again professor forbes gives an interesting account of a knapsack lost by a guide who fell into a crevasse one of those great chasms which are often observed in glaciers which was recovered ten years later four thousand three hundred feet lower down these facts were there no others would suffice to prove that the glaciers move onward at a slow but steady pace the surface of the glacier is rough and crumbling and the traveller can walk upon it without fear of slipping in some parts it is unbroken and undulating but in others it is rent by yawning fissures many hundred feet in depth one set of fissures sometimes crossing another at right angles and so cutting up the ice in fantastic pinnacles and towers that occasionally topple over with a terrific crash the noises that proceed from the glacier cannot be properly described and we can only vaguely compare the mysterious rumblings growls and cracklings that salute the traveller's ear to noises in a swound various theories have been advanced to account for the motion of glaciers saussure who was the first to observe these wonderful ice rivers with any attention asserted that they advance by sliding along their beds which are constantly lubricated by the melting of the lower strata of ice but this explanation is far from being satisfactory ice is undoubtedly a very slippery substance but it is scarcely credible that a solid mass of ice some twenty miles in length should glide along by reason of its slipperiness to move the leviathan our engineers had to make use of the most powerful machines ever constructed before they could overcome the friction between the mighty ship and the surface upon which it rested but the mass of the leviathan is immeasurably small compared with that of the glacier indeed the river of ice might support a number of such ships and still move onward at its usual speed now in spite of the lubricating fluid which saussure imagined to exist between the glacier and its rocky bed the friction must be immense and we can scarcely reconcile the steady movement of the frozen mass with the operation of such a powerful retarding force again it may be asked how does the huge icicle adapt itself to the irregular form of the valley through which it travels a solid mass of ice however large might possibly slide along a perfectly straight channel but mere slipperiness would not enable it to pass through a tortuous valley the diameter of the great basin of the glacier de talafre on the range of mont blanc is six times as great as the outlet through which the frozen stream eventually squeezes itself saussure's explanation throws no light upon this point and it is quite plain that the philosopher had failed to hit upon the true theory of glacier motion we will pass over the theory of m agassiz which was founded on a radical error and proceed to consider that advanced by professor james forbes of edinburgh in eighteen forty two this celebrated geologist undertook an extensive series of observations from which dates the commencement of all sound and accurate knowledge respecting our moving lands the laws of glacier motion were established by a few simple observations he showed that the glacier moves onward with such regularity that it is almost possible to tell the hour by the progress of a point placed on the surface but that the motion is less rapid in summer than in winter in damp than in dry weather at night than during the day the different parts of the same glacier do not advance at a uniform rate and the centre invariably moves more rapidly than the sides if a series of points be laid out in a straight line across the glacier they will be rapidly bent into the form of a regular curve by the gradual decrease of velocity from the centre to the sides further observations in subsequent seasons proved that the upper part of the glacier moves faster than that near to the bottom these observations established the strange and unexpected conclusion that the ice of the glaciers 
though apparently hard and brittle, can be bent and moulded under the enormous pressure of its own weight, and that instead of moving like an ordinary solid, it flows down the valley just as a viscous substance, such as a partially melted pitch, would flow. Professor Forbes actually attributed this manner of motion to a slight degree of plasticity, or a demi-semi-fluidity in the ice mass, and announced his new theory of glacier motion in these words. A glacier is an imperfect fluid, or a viscous body, which is urged down the slopes of a certain inclination by the mutual pressure of its parts. Our moving lands are thus robbed of their solidity, and become mere sluggish rivers of a marvellous sticky fluid, which we are unable to define with anything like accuracy. For the ice it isn't water, and the water isn't free, and we cannot say that anything is as it ought to be. But are we quite sure that the viscous theory is the only possible explanation of glacier motion? It is quite certain that the manner of movement of the surface of a glacier coincides with the manner of motion of a viscous or semi-fluid body, but we have many reasons for doubting the viscosity of glacier ice. The yawning crevasses, the fantastic towers, and the perpetual cracking noise of a glacier would seem to prove that it is formed of a very brittle material. But a substance cannot be brittle and viscous at the same time, and we are quite at a loss to explain how it is that the motion of a mass of ice conforms to that of an imperfect fluid. Professor Tyndall has recently cleared up the mystery, and has shown that ice may be plastic without being viscous. Some time ago, Professor Faraday discovered that two pieces of ice, when placed in contact, would freeze together, even under hot water, and that any number of fragments would unite into a solid mass, provided sufficient pressure were applied to bring their surfaces together. The plasticity of ice has since been established beyond all question by the beautiful experiments of the younger philosopher. Spheres of ice have been flattened into cakes, cakes have been formed into transparent lenses, a block of ice has been moulded into a crystal cup, and a straight bar six inches long has been bent into a semi-ring. Ice can be forced into a mould and made to take what shape we please, not because it is an imperfect fluid like plaster of Paris, but because it possesses the peculiar property of reuniting by the contact of adjoining surfaces, after having been broken into fragments. In forcing a cube of ice into a cup-shaped mould, we crush it to a powder, but the particles composing this powder immediately freeze together again into a solid and transparent cup. The plasticity of ice may therefore be explained as the effect of breakage and refreezing, or, in scientific language, fracture and regelation. This strange property of ice fully accounts for its obedience to the law of glacier motion discovered by Professor Forbes. All the phenomena of motion, says Tyndall, on which the idea of viscosity has been based, are brought by such experiments as the above into harmony with the demonstrable property of ice. In virtue of this property, the glacier accommodates itself to its bed, while preserving its general continuity. Crevasses are closed up, and the broken ice of a cascade, such as that of the Talafrere or the Rhone, is recompacted into a solid, continuous mass. But if the glacier accomplishes its movements in virtue of the incessant fracture and regelation of its parts, such a process will be accompanied by a crackling noise, corresponding in intensity to the nature of the motion, and which would be absent if the motion were that of a viscous body. It is well known that such noises are heard, from the rudest crashing and quaking down to the lowest decrepitation, and they thus receive a satisfactory explanation. The reader will now be able to comprehend the wonderful phenomena presented by our moving lands. A glacier does not slide along its bed like a launching ship along her ways, nor does it flow, in virtue of any viscous quality, like thick mud or melted pitch, but its motion is the result of the minute, almost molecular fracture and regelation of the ice particles, which move as if they were sand, continually thawing and refreezing. We have said that glaciers generally carry large fragments of rock, which they deposit in confused heaps at their lower extremities. It sometimes happens, however, that a glacier descends into a lake or into the sea before it melts, and large masses of it, or icebergs, are floated off with their freight of rock fragments. These loaded icebergs are sometimes carried great distances before they entirely dissolve, and in this manner large unworn angular blocks of rock may be dropped on the bed of the sea hundreds of miles from their original site. 
in many parts of great britain the geologist finds heaps of gravel and sand containing large fragments of rock which exactly resemble the terminal heaps or moraines of modern glaciers he also finds huge blocks of rock or boulders resting upon the bare surface of rocks of quite a different character one of the largest of the boulders is situated at the head of the devil's glen in the county of wicklow its dimensions being twenty-seven feet long by eighteen wide and fifteen high it consists of granite and rests upon a bed of slate six or eight miles from the granite district a wide shallow valley intervening another large boulder of granite has recently been discovered in the chalk near croydon and geologists have come to the conclusion that this mass of rock must have wandered hither from the north of europe these curious heaps and boulders prove that once upon a time the glens of our present mountains were encumbered with glaciers and that our lowlands were entirely submerged by the action of these glaciers the rocks were scored and rounded polished and grooved and masses of rock carried down and heaped into moraines while great blocks were transported on fragments of those glaciers which dipped into the sea and formed icebergs being often carried far over the shallow seas and dropped many miles from their parent sites generally on the banks and shallows now the hilltops which arrested the laden icebergs in their course we have said that our moving lands advance with great regularity let the reader glance at the illustration which precedes this chapter and he will find that our artist has represented this motion by the figure of time using his scythe as an alpenstock and sliding along the glacier upon which he stands end of chapter seventeen Chapter Eighteen of the Fairy Tales of Science by John Cargill Brogue. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Gnomes. Day's dazzling light annoys, night's darkness only joys the cunning gnomes who dwell deep underneath earth's shell. From the German. Repair we to the home of the gnomes to the stalactite cavern where fancy may revel and imagination soar where every hue of the rainbow every sparkle of the gem and every metal sheen shall be reflected in the light of the torch we bear in our hands before us a perspective of brilliancy a crystalline canopy overhead which in the torch flame sparkles with a myriad diamond rays and upon whose surface multitudes of sparry globules rival the charms of burnished gold beauty and grace displayed everywhere in the architecture of the stalactite columns which support the roof in the simulated forms of altars trees and stony organ barrels which meet our gaze on every side and in the grouping of the transparent tubes which depend from the ceiling now hanging singly like monster icicles now clustering into elegant chandeliers and now twirling in spiral and festoon imitating the most elaborate gothic tracery passing onward through antechambers and corridors of seeming porphyry and jasper our ears are saluted by the trickle and fall of large heavy drops of water the only sounds to be heard in this vast and wonderful gnome palace now we reach a vaulted chamber the roof of which is sustained by arches springing from pillars of every form and colour the floor is inlaid with chequered slabs the walls are composed of broken and detached masses of rock piled one upon another in picturesque irregularity while high above us fantastic forms of stalactite are arranged with a grandeur beyond the workmanship of mortal we enter another apartment still more magnificent its walls are of purple marble embellished with branching sprays of rock crystal which on the purple ground assume the hue of amethyst the festoons of jewelled flowers and the brilliant scrollwork of the ceiling the cascades of crystal suddenly arrested into rigidity and the uneven pavement of gold and red green and azure underneath our feet combine to produce an effect of unparalleled grandeur our eyes are dazzled by the scene our footsteps are arrested by a vague terror born of so much weird beauty while our mind is enthralled by its presence we are deep deep down in the bowels of the earth trespassers in the land of the creatures whom light annoys shall we extinguish our torch and so allow the thick darkness to fall upon us like a pall shall we restore to these subterranean chambers their native gloom 
and shall we invoke by such an act the presence of those weird beings whom darkness joys the consequence of our deed would be not an apparition of the gnomes but the loss of the track by which we entered these gorgeous caverns now grim and gloomy our danger would thus be in the absence of living creatures and not in their presence science which wars against ignorance on the earth above has descended to these depths to strike the spectre from the hand of the gnome king and to banish his subjects to the mysterious regions of no man's land leaving only these jewelled caves to astonish and delight us the old story-tellers whose rich and active fancy peopled the air with sylphs and the waters with nymphs created the gnomes to be the guardians of the untold wealth of these subterranean realms queer little fellows were these underground people and wonderful stories have been related of them in the night when mortals were fast asleep they would sometimes ascend to the moonlit surface of the earth and dance about the hills till cockcrow some say that they had no music but howling and whimpering and that the sounds which proceeded from their midnight assemblies were often mistaken for the cries of children and the mewing of cats they were jet black and hideously ugly having misshapen bodies large heads and great round eyes always red as if from weeping nor was their ill-favoured appearance redeemed by a sweetness of disposition as they were invariably crabbed and malicious we are told that they were cunning workers in metals and that the swords manufactured by them were as flexible as rushes and as hard as diamonds the gnomes figured in our illustration must be the last of their race indeed we are inclined to believe that those quaint dwarfs were merely creations of our artist's fancy the reader however must not suppose that the description we have given of the gnome palace is the offspring of imagination such caverns do really exist beneath the surface of this planet and their fantastic architecture is the result of the percolation of water through limestone their pillars arches and stony icicles having been moulded out of the calcareous matter which the fluid dissolved while infiltrating through the fissures and cavities of overlying beds of rock the grotto of antiparos in the grecian archipelago is a gnome palace quite as wonderful as that we have just pictured countless stalactites depending from above together with an indescribable accumulation of crystallized masses on the walls ornament a chamber with an arched roof upwards of one hundred and twenty feet in length the floor of this cavern is paved with polished marble of a delicate green colour and the columns which appear to support the roof seem to be formed of a deep burning red porphyry but this cavern is merely the entrance hall of the subterranean palaces the principal apartment or throne room is incomparably more gorgeous at a depth of fifteen hundred feet below the surface of the earth the traveller finds himself in a grotto whose height is one hundred feet while it extends to a length of three hundred and forty feet here the pillars are of yellow marble petrifactions resembling snakes trees and shrubs abound and in some places icicles of pure white glistening marble depend from the roof to a length of ten feet the tales told of this awe-inspiring gnome palace have assumed the tone of the wildest romance and its diamond-spangled caves and walls of ruby have been described with all the vividness of overwrought imagination nevertheless all this wondrous architecture all these wild and fantastic forms and every phenomenon attending the production of the roofs sides and floors of these caverns can be accounted for as we have said by the percolation of water clear as crystal but charged with calcareous material in these caverns we discover stalactites in every stage of growth and are thus enabled to conceive how a single specimen is formed a drop of water holding a quantity of limestone in solution hangs from the roof and as the fluid evaporates the calcareous matter is left behind in course of time a little conical button of spar is formed and as fresh matter is constantly being deposited from the water which trickles over it this button gradually assumes the form of a long stony icicle again the water that falls upon the floor of the cavern instead of hollowing out a cup-shaped cavity by its continued action during long ages gradually builds up the accumulation termed the stalagmite which rising from the floor eventually meets the descending stalactite and thus helps to form a graceful column when the lapidifying water oozes through a long joint or crevice in the roof 
it forms a beautiful transparent curtain of spar, and when it percolates through the sides of the cave, it deposits its calcareous particles in the form of a frozen cascade. All the sparry ornaments of these underground palaces were formerly held to be the handiwork of the gnomes, and in the present day, those vacant of our glorious gains in knowledge, would doubtless regard this opinion with more favor than that which ascribes the fantastic architecture of the caverns to the formative power of a myriad trickling drops of water. Out of Gnomeland, solid marble is deposited by exactly the same process. Wherever water holding carbonate of lime in solution is brought into circumstances favorable to rapid evaporation. Sticks and twigs hanging over brooks often become coated with calcareous matter, and the incrustation of birds' nests, medallions, moss, and even old wigs, by the action of the petrifying springs of Derbyshire, is known to every one who has visited that romantic and interesting county. In Italy, large masses of solid and beautiful travertine are deposited by some of the springs, and in the famous lake of Solfatera, the formation of this stone is so rapid that insects as well as plants and shellfish are frequently encrusted and destroyed. The term travertine is derived from the Tiber, its literal significance being Tiber stone. A considerable number of edifices in Italy, both ancient and modern, are constructed of stone thus formed. The Cyclopean walls and temples of Paestrum and the Colosseum at Rome are built of huge blocks of travertine, which must have been deposited particle by particle in lakes similar to that of Solfatara. But the most remarkable instance of the rapid formation of marble occurs in Persia. The beautiful transparent stone called Tabriz marble is formed by deposition from the water of a celebrated spring which rises near Maraga. Here the process of petrifaction may be traced from its first beginning to its termination. In one part the water is perfectly clear, in another dark, muddy, and stagnant, in a third it is quite black and very thick, while in the last stage it is as white as snow. The petrified ponds look like frozen water. A stone thrown upon them breaks the crust, and a black fluid exudes through the opening. But when the process of petrifaction has reached a certain stage, a man may walk upon the surface without wetting his shoes. The stony mass is finely laminated, and a section of it resembles an accumulation of sheets of coarse paper. Such is the constant tendency of this water to solidify, that the very bubbles on its surface become hard, as if, by a stroke of magic, they had been arrested and metamorphosed into marble. Return we to our subterranean regions, promising that we will not ascend to the surface again, unless such a course should appear absolutely necessary to the elucidation of our subject. In Gnome Land there are other wonders besides the capacious caverns, with their glancing roofs and walls and clustering stalactite columns. The hidden treasures of the earth, or in more ordinary language, the bowels of the earth, are only to be exceeded in their wondrous accumulation and occurrence by their vastness and value. The gnomes were formerly held to be the legitimate guardians of these treasures, and for the sake of our fairy tale we will suppose this view to be founded on facts. As mere storytellers, we may create just as many giants, fairies, or gnomes as we please, even though we think it fit to destroy them afterwards. Let us therefore people our stalactite cavern with elves like those to which our artist's fancy has given birth. What a wonderful scene meets our mental vision! The grotto is filled with active little beings, all busily employed in different operations connected with mining and metallurgy. On every side there are miniature forges, and the ceaseless clatter of innumerable tiny hammers is absolutely deafening. Each little smith wields his sledge with a superhuman energy, and never seems to require rest. Some of the gnomes are digging holes in the marble floor, and others are carrying away the excavated material in little wheelbarrows, the like of which would make a toyman's fortune. In one part of the cave a crowd of miners are very hard at work with spade and pickaxe, while others near them are turning a windlass by the action of which a little tram is drawn up from the floor of the cavern to the roof, and probably much higher, as it passes through a fissure and remains out of sight for some time. When it descends, it is either empty or freighted with gnomes who come to relieve their brethren at the windlass. Some of these underground people are chipping shapeless minerals into regular geometric crystals, 
others are polishing fragments of spar, others are casting metals into beautiful, aborescent forms. To describe all the various occupations of these elves would take up too much time, and we are therefore compelled to leave much to the reader's imagination. The poet tells us that dazzling light annoys the gnomes, but this statement is far from being true. The cavern is illuminated not by torches or candles, but by the crystals with which its walls and roof are studded. Each crystal is a lamp, every cluster a dazzling chandelier, and the scintillation of myriads of these natural lamps produces an effect of indescribable brilliancy. But see, here comes an aristocratic gnome, arrayed in a tunic of asbestos, and wearing a cap formed of precious stones. He sits on a little stalagmite, and looks up at us with an impudent air, as though he thought us very inferior beings. This conceited little jackanapes has evidently something to say to us, so we will assume a becoming gravity, and endeavour to become attentive listeners. "'I am the chief guardian of the jewels. To me is entrusted the care of the sparkling diamond, the flaming ruby, the cerulean sapphire, the green emerald, the yellow topaz, the purple streaming amethyst, and all the precious stones which you mortals prize so highly. His small mightiness pauses for a moment, probably to give us time to form an adequate idea of his immense importance. As you have been permitted to enter our abode, he continues, I will reveal to you a few secrets concerning the treasures I guard. You are doubtless aware that this diamond is merely a bit of crystallized charcoal. But I trust you do not think meanly of this princely gem on that account. Were you to estimate the value of things by their composition, the finest marble and the coarsest chalk would be placed on an equality, or to choose an example from human nature, the wisest philosopher would be no better than the greatest dunce. The diamond is my most precious charge. It surpasses all other gems in hardness and luster, and its beauty and rarity have rendered it peculiarly attractive to you men. My richest diamond beds are situated in the Brazils and in Bengal but I have scattered these gems over many parts of the world. They may be found in alluvial deposits of sand and gravel, lying in detached octahedral crystals, sometimes with plain, but more frequently with rounded surfaces. When perfectly pure, a diamond is as transparent as a drop of the purest water, in which state it is known to you who live overhead as a diamond of the first water, and in proportion as it falls short of this perfection, it is said to be of the second, third, or fourth water till it becomes a coloured one. Coloured diamonds are brown, yellow, green, blue, or red. The deeper the colour, the more valuable they are, though still inferior to those absolutely colourless. Many of my largest diamonds have fallen into the hands of man. The famous Kohinoor, or Mountain of Light, was removed from the mines of Golconda more than three hundred years ago. But though it was thus taken out of my keeping, I never lost sight of it, and I was extremely pleased to see it pass into the possession of the Queen of England. A slight sketch of the history of this remarkable jewel may, perhaps, be interesting to you. It was first brought to light by the miners of Golconda in the year 1550, and became the property of the reigning prince. When the Mogul princes extended their pretensions to the sovereignty of the Deccan, the Koinor passed from Golconda to Delhi, where it was seen in 1665 by the French traveller Tavernier, who, by the extraordinary indulgence of Aurangzebe, was permitted to handle, examine, and weigh it. In the year 1739, Nadir Shah, the Persian invader, seized the precious jewel and carried it back with him. But it was destined to pass from Persia as quickly as that ephemeral supremacy, in virtue of which it had been acquired. Soon after his return, the Persian conqueror was assassinated by his own subjects, and the great diamond was carried off by Ahmed Shah. At the commencement of the present century, the treasures of Ahmed were vested in Zamwan Shah, who was deposed and imprisoned by his brother, Shah Shuja. For some time the Koinor was missing, but at length it was discovered ingeniously secreted in the walls of Zamwan Shah's prison. When Shah Shuja was expelled from Kabul by the British, he contrived to make this far-famed diamond the companion of his flight. He found refuge at the court of Runjit Singh, who demanded the jewel in return for his protection, and thus the great diamond of the Mughals became the property of the warlike chief of the Sikhs. You must be aware that the Koinor formed part of the spoil taken by the English in the Sikh war, 
and that it was one of the chief attractions of your great exhibition in eighteen fifty one and that it has since been recut and placed among the jewels of your queen such is the history of that marvellous gem which in point of size is still without a rival though cutting has reduced it to little more than one-third of its original weight in its rough state the kohinoor is said to have weighed nearly eight hundred carats a carat being three and one-eighth troy grains you would probably like to know something about the previous history of this stone i could tell you how it was originally formed and how it came to be deposited with the gravel and sand of golconda but i have my own reasons for keeping these matters secret science will one day enable you to solve many problems connected with the formation of gems and will perhaps teach you how to manufacture kohinoors from coal or charcoal till then i shall keep my own counsel many of the jewels under my care are composed of alumina and bear the same relation to clay that the diamond bears to coal of these aluminous gems the rubies are the most valuable on account of their extreme rarity their matchless hues and the brilliant stars of light which they exhibit when viewed in certain directions the sapphire another of my precious charges is merely a blue variety of the same substance as that which when red is called ruby flint or silica forms the base of innumerable mineral treasures quartz is formed of pure silica and is often found crystallized in beautiful six-sided prisms ending in six-sided pyramids when coloured by slight admixtures of other substances such as iron and manganese quartz goes under various names according to the variety and arrangement of colours crystalline form and state of transparency when purple it is called amethyst and is highly prized by you mortals smoky quartz is called carngorm when blue it is known as siderite and when yellow as scotch or bohemian topaz agate jasper carnelian onyx chalcedony and opal are merely varieties of the same abundant substance the emerald again one of the most esteemed gems is nothing but transparent flint colored green by oxide of chromium my time is precious and although i have given you but an imperfect idea of the mineral treasures that i have to guard i must now leave you as my presence is required at the diamond mines of brazil the inferior gnomes under my control are continually engaged in building up new minerals in filling empty veins with spar in polishing crystals and in performing a thousand mysterious processes of a chemical or electrical nature it is no easy task i can assure you to superintend these countless operations and i need scarcely tell you that my time is fully occupied so farewell the gnome takes off his jewelled cap makes a low bow and disappears but here comes another little fellow in far more splendid habiliments than those of the guardian of the gems he wears a complete suit of armor every plate of which is formed of a different metal his helmet is of gold and surmounted by a graceful plume formed entirely of the finest conceivable silver wire everything about him is metallic and so highly polished that our eyes are fairly dazzled by the apparition as he walks towards us his armor makes a pleasant jingling noise and as he sits down on the stalagmite vacated by his brother gnome we hear such a crash that we half expect to see the elaborate suit of metal tumble into pieces i come to speak to you of the real treasures of the earth and not of those useless bodies misnamed precious stones i am the keeper of the metals those wonderful substances which have been such important aids to human progress and without which indeed any high degree of civilization were impossible unlike the jewels guarded by the boastful gnome who vanished as i approached the metals are not merely ornamental for you must be aware that they are essential to every process connected with the tilling of the soil the building of the houses and temples the construction of roads the manufacture of clothing the navigation of seas to every art in fine which elevates man above the condition of the brute i will not attempt to describe the properties of the various metals confided to my care nor will i speak of the uses to which they are applied by man for surely you ought to know more about human works than a gnome i shall merely allude to the states in which the metals occur in these subterranean regions for you must know that they are seldom to be met with in a state of purity the little man of metal now takes off his helmet and drawing his tiny legs under him into a comfortable position speaks as follows 
the metals nearly always occur in the crude state of ores. These ores are sulfides, oxides, and carbonates, mingled with earthly impurities, generally situated in fissures or rents in the rocks, which are called veins or lodes. I may as well inform you at once that these fissures are produced by the upheaval and depression of the rocks which they traverse. The internal fires of this wonderful planet sometimes exert a force sufficient to raise vast masses of rock, of unknown but immense thickness, from the bottom of the sea high into the air, in order to form dry land. You may easily imagine, therefore, that this force is also sufficient to crack and rend the earth's crust in every direction, and thus form the veins in which the metallic ores are deposited. The respective metals do not always lie in separate veins, for though one metal generally predominates, three, four, or even more metals may be strangely combined and intermixed in the same veinstone. Thus, the vein which contains lead as the principal metal frequently contains small quantities of silver, zinc, and cobalt. Manganese is often associated with iron, while platinum is usually mixed with gold. Besides the ores of metals, these veins almost always contain quartz, floor spar, crystalline carbonate of lime, and other spars. Ores and spars, however, are not confined to the deep fissures that occur in the earth's crust. They find their way into all kinds of cracks and cavities, whatever may have been the cause of the hollows, and even into detached holes, often no larger than your fist, and completely surrounded by solid rock. Wherever, indeed, permanent hollows and interstices of any kind, size, shape, or origin, exist in hard rocks, crystallized minerals, spars, and ores may be formed in them. How do these matters reach the cavities is a problem which you will perhaps expect me to solve, but if so, you will be disappointed. A number of clever mortals are striving to arrive at the true solution of this mysterious question, and were I to tell you all I know, I should be robbing some future philosopher of the fame that would accrue from a great discovery. I will, however, give you one or two hints, which may help you to form some conception of the mode in which the veins and isolated cavities may be filled. Look around at these walls of crystal, these pillars of porphyry, this floor of marble, and these hanging stalactites. All these things have been formed since this cavern was hollowed out by the disturbing forces of nature. How did they find their way hither, you will perhaps ask? They came by water, not in large masses, but particle by particle, dissolved in the minute drops of fluid which percolated through the rocks overhead. May not the minerals have been introduced into the rock cavities by water also? May not each detached and isolated nest of minerals be a miniature stalactite cavern? If the mineral contents of veins have not been deposited from aqueous solutions, they may have been introduced by sublimation. Many of the metals may be converted into vapor by intense heat, and provided it be possible for mineral vapors to gain access to fissures and rocks, is it not impossible for some of them to be condensed and deposited on the sides of the lodes? Gold ranks among the first of the metals though its rarity renders it of less importance to man than some of the less perfect ones. This kingly metal occurs in almost every quarter of the globe, and is obtained by the miner either in the metallic or native state, from alluvial sands and gravels, or from veins in combination with silver, and often mixed with sulfides of other metals. In its native state it occurs in small crystals, in threads, or granular fragments, and in curiously shaped nuggets. Silver is a still more widely disseminated product of nature, occurring in veins in granitic mountains, and in the most ancient sedimentary rocks. It is sometimes found in a native state, though less frequently than gold. Iron is far more valuable than either of the so-called precious metals, and its ores are scattered over the crust of the globe with a beneficent profusion proportionate to the utility of the metal. One of your best authors has well remarked, that he who first made known the use of iron may be truly styled the father of arts and author of plenty. What miserable creatures you mortals would be without this marvellous substance! Banish the ploughshare, the anchor, and the needle from the world. There would be an end to agriculture, to navigation, and to the fashioning of clothes. You would be reduced to the state of barbarism, and in your naked and forlorn condition, your time would be fully occupied in seeking your scanty meal of acorns, and in paddling about in your rude canoe, intent upon spearing a stray fish with your wooden lance. You would cease to be interested in the fairy tales of science, and the long result of time could have no possible attraction 
for a hungry savage like you. Copper, lead, and tin are also estimable treasures. Indeed, there is not a single metal which has not contributed, or at any rate may not contribute, to man's comfort and happiness. Look upon me as the friend of the human race, for it is I who superintend the filling of the veins with ores and all the metallurgical operations of nature's laboratory. But here is another gnome, who, despite his ugliness, has quite as great a claim to your respect as I have. I leave you with him. So saying, the armor-clad spirit vanishes in a most mysterious manner, before we can shape our grateful thoughts into words. The gnome who now seats himself on the sparry throne is a sombre-looking little imp, with something so repulsive, and at the same time something so ludicrous in his whole appearance, that we are undecided whether we ought to run away or burst out laughing. His ugly face wears a very comical expression, and is as black as jet. His crooked body is clothed in a suit of shining black. His legs are black, his feet are black. In fine, he is black all over. But what renders this strange being so terrible is a circle of flames which surrounds his head and forms a sort of fiery crown. "'I am the gnome of the coal measures,' says the little blackamoor, "'those wondrous accumulations of ancient vegetable matter that abound in these subterranean realms. I need not tell you that coal is one of the greatest treasures hidden in the bowels of the earth. By it man heats his apartments, cooks his food, fuses the metals, and produces steam, which sets all kinds of machinery in motion. With it he feeds his iron horses, which drag him from place to place, with the velocity of the wind, and with it he raises an agent that propels his ships along the pathless deep, against wind and tide. You are familiar with the general aspect and nature of coal, and are doubtless aware that it is almost wholly composed of the element carbon. Were I to describe the immense varieties of coal that occur in nature, you would not thank me for my trouble, and would probably fall asleep long before I reached the end of my list. These different varieties of coal may, however, be grouped under three heads, anthracite, ordinary or pit coal, and brown coal or lignite. Anthracite is a natural coke or charcoal, and may be regarded as the most completely mineralized form of coal. If you handle a piece of this substance, you will find that it does not soil the fingers like ordinary coal, that it is much heavier, and that it has a glistening and semi-metallic aspect. It is not easily ignited, but when burning gives out a fierce heat, and neither flames nor smokes. Ordinary coal has many varieties, which, however, may be classified into four kinds. The first kind is called caking coal, from its fusing or running together on the fire, so as to form clinkers. Split or hard coal comes next, which is not easily broken, nor is it easily kindled, though it affords a clear and lasting fire when once ignited. Cherry or soft coal is an abundant and beautiful kind, and highly prized by mortals. It does not cake when heated, it can be broken with ease, and it readily catches fire, requiring but little stirring and giving out a cheerful flame and heat. Another kind is called cannel coal. It is always compact and does not soil the fingers. It varies much in appearance, from a dull earthy to a lustrous wax-like substance. The bright shining varieties often burn away like wood, leaving scarcely any cinders, and only a little white ash, while the duller kinds leave white masses of ash, almost equal in size and shape to the original lumps of coal. Jet, of which you make necklaces and bracelets, is merely an extreme variety of cannel coal. Brown coal or lignite is a substance of comparatively recent formation, and it sometimes exhibits the structure of the plants from which it is derived, the trunks and branches being plainly perceptible. This brown coal is only had recourse to where there are no older beds beneath, or where they are too far down to be reached by the miner. Although you mortals are constantly consuming vast quantities of coal in your stoves, fireplaces, and engine furnaces, I give you my word that there is quite enough in the earth's crust to supply all your wants for thousands of years to come. Many of the great coal fields are as yet untouched, for until the wood of a new country is used, and civilization has made some progress, Man never dreams of looking for his fuel in Gnomeland. Where have we been? To Gnomeland or to Dreamland? The cavern and all its weird inhabitants have vanished. We are sitting at our desk, 
with a textbook of mineralogy open before us, the source from which our fairy tale proceeded. End of chapter 18「Chapter Nineteen, Part One of the Fairy Tales of Science by John Cargill Brogue. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Pluto's Kingdom, Part One. Down to the innermost core of this our Mother Earth, to the sad realm of shades, where Pluto sits enthroned, in gloomy majesty, grim king of death, and phlegathontic rills roll waves of lured fire. There will I lead, and thou wilt follow me. Klopstock. They were brethren three, sons of old time, who shared among them the dominion of the world. Jupiter, the eldest of them, assumed the supreme rule of heaven and earth. To Neptune was given the empire of the sea. Pluto had assigned to his sway the interior of the earth, the realm of death. The name of Pluto is taken from a Greek word signifying wealth, and was therefore most appropriately given to the master of all the hidden treasures of the earth. The Latins called the kingdom of the infernum dis, that is, dives, the wealthy. The gate to the dominions of Pluto was guarded by the many-headed dog, Cerberus. Three heads only, and three necks, are generally given to this marvellous beast. Hesiod, however, the second father of most of these creatures of the imagination, eclept the gods of Greece, gives Cerberus fifty heads, whilst Horus, more bountiful still, supplies him with a hundred of these useful appendages. To get there you had to pass the famous river Styx, or the Sad River. Over this you were ferried by Charon, the son of Hell and Night, for the small consideration of an obolus, an Athenian coin worth about five farthings of our money, which the ancients, for this reason, used to put in the mouths of the dead. But woe unto those shadows whose bodies had had no burial! For a hundred years had they to wander by the side of the river, before they could hope to induce the grim ferryman to carry them over and grim he was this ferryman and far from prepossessing if the portrait drawn of him by virgil may be considered a correct likeness a frightfully ugly old man with glaring eyes and a bushy matted beard a dirty dark-coloured mantle fastened with a knot hanging down from his left shoulder the river styx or the stygian lake as it is also called encircled hell in a sevenfold embrace there dwelt a marvellous power in the name to which even the highest divinities were subject. If any of the gods swore falsely by it, a hundred years' exile from heaven, with loss for that time of all the rights, privileges, and other appurtenances belonging to divinity, punished the perjurer. Four other rivers, besides Styx, flowed through the sad realms of death, the Acheron, the Cochytus, the Phlegathon, and the Lethe. The Phlegathon was a lake of liquid fire. Whoever drank of the waters of the Lethe forgot all that was past. According to the doctrine of the transmigration of souls taught by Pythagoras, in the sixth century B.C., the souls of the departed were made to drink the waters of the Lethe, when quitting the infernal regions to return to the surface of the earth, to animate new bodies there. Pythagoras travelled through Egypt, Central Asia, and Hindustan in search of knowledge. On his return he opened a school of philosophy in Lower Italy, about the time of Servius Tullius, or Tarquinius Cerberus. He believed in the transmigration of souls, and affirmed that he could distinctly remember several previous existences of his own. His scholars yielded him the most implicit faith, and thought it sufficient to reply to a controverting argument, himself has said it. Pluto, the supreme lord and ruler over this subterranean realm, sat there enthroned in gloomy majesty on a seat of ebony, a crown of the same wood encircling his portentous brow, and a two-pronged sceptre in his right hand. On voyages of inspection through his dominions, he rode in a chariot of dark hue, drawn by four jet-black steeds. No temples nor altars were ever raised to him by man, no hymns ever chanted in his praise, and strange enough, from some tacit understanding among the learned of all nations, evidently dictated by some universal, mysterious, intuitive sense of the fitness of things, the starry heavens are, even to the present day, left without a representative of his name. Yet he was acknowledged to be a powerful god, and trembling man would not dare to withhold from him the propitiatory sacrifice. The blood of black rams, split in a pit, was the peace-offering presented to him. 
Pluto's Lord High Treasurer and Secretary of State for the Financial Department was Plutus, the god of wealth, son of Jasius and Cyrus. We find that the ancient Greeks imputed to this god blindness and folly, which in fact would appear to have been the chief qualifications that recommended him for his high office. He was depicted lame in his approach, winged in his departure. Among the other high officers of state in Pluto's court figured more especially the three fatal sisters, Clotho, who held the spindle and drew the thread of man's life, Lachesis, who spun it, and Atropis, who cut it asunder with her relentless scissors. The three infernal judges, Minos, the lord chief justice of hell, the son of Jupiter and Europa, Wylam king and lawgiver of the Cretans, and his two assistant judges, Aeacus, the son of Jupiter and Aegina, and Radamanathus, also a Cretan lawgiver. The bestowal of the highest and most important offices of state upon the sons and nearest relatives of the chief gods affords a curious illustration of how thoroughly the ancients had moulded their gods upon the model of human nature and made them in their own image. Thus we find two out of three judgeships of hell given to sons of Jupiter, two calm chez nous. These three presided over the great interminable commission of Oyer and Terminer, an everlasting universal jail delivery, held in the infernum. Before their dread tribunal had to appear all the shades of the departed, no appeal from their decrees. Instant execution attended their sentences. The officials upon whom devolved the execution of the judgments given by this model star chamber were presided over by three most unamiable females, holding lighted torches in their hands, and with a fanciful arrangement of snakes dangling round their heads in lieu of hair. Electo, the never-resting, Majira, the type of envy, Tisiphone, the avenger of blood. The empire of the dead was divided into two parts, Tartarus, or hell proper, and Elysium, or the Elysian fields. Tartarus was the place of punishment assigned to the criminals condemned by the dark tribunal. Here might be seen the titans and the giants, who had dared to war against heaven's king. Here Salmonius of Elis, who had impiously attempted to imitate Jupiter's thunder by rattling his torch-lighted chariot over a bridge of brass. Here the robber Sisyphus, condemned to eternal fruitless labor of rolling an immense stone to the top of a high mountain, which it has hardly reached when it rolls down again. Here Titius, the giant offspring of earth, who had been so ill-advised as to compete with Jupiter for the possession of Latona, but was straightways cast down into hell by the indignant god. Here he covered nine acres of land, as he lay stretched on the ground, with vultures on both sides devouring his entrails, which kept on growing afresh as fast as they were eaten away. Here Ixion, tied with serpents to an eternally turning wheel, for having dared to aspire to the favors of Juno. Here Tantalus, condemned eternally to stand in water to the chin, and with abundance of pleasant fruit just at his lips, without the power of even once satisfying his hunger, or quenching his thirst. A fearful punishment indeed, yet well deserved, for that he, to test the divinity of the gods, had killed his own son, Pelops, and set the limbs before them, baked in a pie. Here the forty-nine daughters of Danaeus, who, obedient to their father's behest, had slain their husbands on the wedding night. Hypermnestra alone, of the fifty daughters of the king, had spared her husband, Lynceus, and she alone was therefore exempt from the punishment decreed to her sisters, who were condemned to eternally and incessantly pour water into a tub full of holes. Elysium, on the other hand, the placid abode of peace and contentment, was assigned for the habitation of the souls of good and virtuous men, the doers of heroic deeds, and those who had rendered important services to humanity. Here the spirits of the blessed wandered in serene happiness, under a sunny and star-spangled sky, in a pure atmosphere over ever-blooming fields, and through ever-green laurel groves, continuing those pursuits and occupations in which they had delighted most in their terrestrial career. Swedenborg, the great Scandinavian dreamer and seer, in his account of the other world, tells a similar tale respecting the pursuits and occupations of the spirits of the departed. Now, however so nice this pleasant little retreat, and fit for a goddess, it would appear that none of these ladies could be persuaded by Pluto to share his throne. Finding the honor of his alliance everywhere declined, with thanks, 
he took at last the desperate step of carrying off to his subterranean realm Persephone, the daughter of his brother Jupiter and his sister Ceres. The bereaved mother lighted torches on Mount Etna, and incessantly, both by day and night, sought for her daughter all over the world, but in vain. Informed at last of the whereabout of her daughter by the nymph Arethusa, she descended to the infernum to claim the restitution of her child, as she decidedly objected to brimstone matches. But Persephone, won over, most likely, to Pluto by the splendor of his throne, showed no great eagerness to comply with Mama's peremptory request to instantly come out of that, and poor Ceres was obliged, as a last resource, to appeal to the justice and power of Jupiter. He decreed that Persephone should return to heaven, provided she had tasted nothing in hell. But unfortunately, one of those busybodies who are always poking their noses into other people's affairs, one as Caliphus, son of Acheron and Orphne, stood forward as witness on Pluto's behalf, deposing that he had seen the lady eating seven pomegranate seeds as she walked in Pluto's orchard. Whereupon, all hope of a return being gone, the angry mother touched the luckless Ascalaphus with her magic wand, and enriched the tribe of owls by a new species. It would, however, appear that Jupiter, afterwards yielding to the deep grief and the incessant lamentations of his sister, granted that her daughter should only live six months in the year with her husband below, and the other six months with the gods above. Such as we have here endeavored to sketch it, in a few rapid outlines, was the kingdom of Pluto, in the ideal conception of the ancient Greeks, that nation of poets. To us, alack and alas for the poetry of the thing, to us, the sons of a hard, stern, matter-of-fact age, a very different image presents itself. We still make use of the name, indeed, but the god, with all that pertained unto him, has departed for ever and ever more. Our Pluto's kingdom is the mass of liquid fire that constitutes the inner kernel of the earth. To us, he is the great fire king, and he and his realm are one. It is now an almost universally received notion, by astronomers as well as by geologists, that this globe of ours, as indeed all other planetary bodies, once existed in a gaseous form, and was subsequently, by chemical combination of the gases constituting it, and consequent evolution of heat, gradually condensed into a glowing, fusing mass, which, being whirled round in space, ultimately assumed, under the conjoint action of gravity and the rotatory projecting impulse inherent in it, its present state an orange-shaped form, the surface or crust gradually cooling and hardening in process of time. If you wish to form some intelligible conception of the state and condition of the earth, you need simply to go to a foundry and watch the cooling of a cannonball heated to redness. As it cools, you see the surface becoming gradually covered with pellicles, or flakes of oxide of iron, whilst a touch will speedily convince you that the heat beneath the surface continues still unabated, and it is only after a certain time, when the process of cooling has extended to the inner part, that you may take up the ball without burning your fingers. Now proceed a little further, take up a mass of cinder or scoria that has cooled, and break it to pieces. You will find that the inside shows streaks and veins of different materials, and presents many cavities or holes called by foundrymen honeycomb. Reflect now that these cavities were formed in the cinder while yet in the red-hot state, either by air or by gases. Think that at the bottom of these cavities there once was floating a small drop of melted matter. Now bring your imagination into play, and let that cinder represent the earth, the cavities subterranean caverns of many hundred square miles, and the melted drop an immense lake of liquid fire, burning, boiling, heaving to the top, enlarging the cavern, melting away parts of the crust nearest to it, or swelling it up until it cracks and forms crevices and fissures for the escape of smoke, flames, and fused matter. Here you have also, at once, an intelligible theory of earthquakes and volcanic eruptions. It has been demonstrated by numerous observations made in mines, and by artesian wells in various countries, that the temperature of the earth rapidly increases with the depth but that the rate of augmentation is different at different places. In the Northumberland coal pits, for instance, one degree Fahrenheit for every forty-four feet in descent. In the lead mines of Saxony, one degree for every sixty-five feet. In the copper mines of Nochmayen, county of Waterford, one degree for every eighty-two feet. 
in the Dolkoth mine in Cornwall, one degree for every seventy-eight feet. Assuming the average increase of temperature to be one degree of Fahrenheit for every sixty feet of depth, and the rate of increase to remain constant, at a depth of sixty thousand feet below the surface of the earth, the temperature must stand at one thousand degrees Fahrenheit, which is that of low red heat. But as the temperature will increase with the depth in an augmenting ratio, Lenhardt assumes that the temperature of a low red heat would be attained already at a depth of thirty-five thousand feet, or double the height of the Cotopaxi, the most remarkable of the Peruvian volcanoes. Descending still lower, to depths varying from eighty to one hundred and sixty miles below the surface, the temperature would be found at that depth to exceed twelve thousand degrees Fahrenheit, a heat sufficient to melt most of the known rocks. But considering that the dense fluid portions of the earth are most probably much better conductors of heat than the crust, it may safely be assumed that this high temperature is acquired at a still less depth. Were we to proceed down to the very centre of the earth, we should there find, supposing a regular rate of progression in the increase of temperature, a heat exceeding 3,500 degrees of Wedgwood's pyrometer, or something like 450,000 degrees Fahrenheit. The solid crust of the earth is generally supposed to be only from 60 to 100 miles thick, and it is probably even much less. That the thickness is very unequal is shown by the variation of temperature, which cannot be attributed solely to different degrees of conductibility in different parts. The process of cooling from the crust downwards is, of course, still going on, but as has been demonstrated by Fourier, at a less rate than was formerly the case. According to the same authority, it will require 30,000 years to reduce the increase of temperature on descending into the interior of the earth from its present rate of one degree Fahrenheit for every sixty feet in descent to one half degree. Some geological chemists have calculated from the known laws of radiation of heat that it would take two hundred million years to cool the earth to its centre. Another point to consider is the density of the earth. The density of the crust lies between 2.7 and 2.9, but we know from most careful and accurate pendulum experiments that the average density of the bulk of the earth is about 5.5. It is quite evident, therefore, that the ponderable matter of the interior must be very much denser than that of the crust. The generally received notion is that, assuming the radius of the earth to measure 4,000 miles in round numbers, and dividing it into ten equal parts of four hundred miles each, the density of the materials, severally constituting the ten divisions, increases in an arithmetical progression by about one point five for each part, which, taking the density of the first annular space of four hundred miles at two point seven, gives for the second four point two, for the third five point seven, and so on, the density of the central portion being about sixteen point two. In Cordier's purely thermometrical theory as to the nature and mode of action of the great elevating force that has at successive periods raised and broken the earth's crust, lifting up various igneous or plutonic rocks, and forcing them into the cracks and fissures, the central nucleus of the earth is considered in the light of an immense sea of molten mineral matter. As the solid crust continues to contract as its temperature decreases in a greater ratio than the central mass, and the velocity of rotation increases as the diameter of the globe shortens, a tendency will necessarily be induced to additional divergence from the spherical form, and the fluid matter within will accordingly press against the contracting crust, and thus produce volcanic eruptions. M. Cordier has calculated that a contraction of one over twelve thousand three hundred and fiftieth of an inch in the mean radius of the earth would be sufficient to force out the matter of a volcanic eruption. And a most wise arrangement of the supreme intelligence it is, which has left open to King Pluto these ready means of forcing an outlet. And man ought to feel rather thankful when he beholds the flaming head of the fire king towering above the crater of some volcano. Earthquakes, surely, are much more terrible and destructive than volcanic eruptions. A volcano may be defined as a perpendicular tunnel in the earth's crust, through which heated matter from below is thrown up to the surface. The matter thrown up may be in the form of lava, scoriae, ashes, mud, etc. The tunnel or fissure is generally called the chimney, vent, or chasm of the volcano. The upper part of the chimney is called the crater. 
it always presents the form of an inverted cone, or the shape of a funnel with the broad part upward. A distinction is made between so-called craters of eruption and craters of elevation. Craters of eruption are formed by the boiling streams of lava, the floods of hot mud, or tuff, and the showers of ashes and cinders gathering or falling around the mouth of the vent or chimney of a volcano. In proportion to the continuance of the eruption and its repetition, successive beds of volcanic products will accumulate round the mouth, and form themselves into the shape of a sugar loaf or cone. Craters of elevation, on the other hand, are formed by the matter of the volcanic eruption lifting the horizontal strata in which the crater is formed, until the beds snap and rest in highly inclined planes about the mouth of the fissure. It occurs also occasionally that both kinds of craters are found in one mountain. The lava in a crater may be burning and boiling for years, without either an eruption of scoriae or an overflow of lava taking place. A multitude of small conical vents are formed, however, in such cases, which rise out of the cooled surface of the melted lava and incessantly emit volumes of smoke and sulfurous vapor. A vent of this kind is called in Europe a fumarole or moffet, and in Mexico a hornito or small oven. Other vents also are produced occasionally on the walls of the crater or on the sides of the mountain by the jets of scoriae thrown up accumulating and falling round the mouth of the vent. The number of volcanoes is very great, more than three hundred of them being known to exist in the world at the present time, of which twenty-four are in Europe, eleven in Africa, forty-six in Asia, one hundred and fourteen in America, and one hundred and eight in Oceania. Most of the islands of the Pacific, and many isles of the Atlantic and Indian Oceans, are also volcanic, or else composed of volcanic rocks. The most ancient volcanoes known are Mount Vesuvius in Italy, Mount Etna in Sicily, and Stromboli, one of the Lipari Islands near Sicily. Stromboli is always burning, which has gained it the name of the Great Lighthouse of the Mediterranean. Mount Vesuvius gave its first notice of action in A.D. 73, when it did much injury to houses and villages upon its flanks. From 73 to 79 there were several small shocks, and in August of the latter year occurred that awful eruption of ashes which destroyed the cities of Herculaneum, Pompeii, and Strabiae, and caused the death of the elder Pliny. From 79 to 1036, six other eruptions of ashes, sand, and shattered fragments of lava took place. In the latter year occurred the first authentic overflow of lava, which was repeated in 1049 and 1138. After this, the mountain rested for 168 years. Another great eruption then took place in 1306, and a slight one in 1500, followed by another repose, which lasted till 1631, when a fearful eruption took place, blowing up into the air the forest of brushwood that covered the sides of the mountain and the luxuriant grassy plain at the bottom. Passing over several other eruptions of the mountain, we come to the one in October 1822, which lasted nearly a month, and was attended by a series of loud detonations and explosions. Between 1800 and 1822, the vast crater formed in 1631 was gradually getting filled up with lava, cinders, and ashes, the bottom presenting a rugged, rocky plain covered with scattered blocks of lava and heaps of cinders. In this eruption of October 1822, the force from below broke up this aggregation of lava blocks at the bottom and hurled them all into the air, leaving behind a tremendous chasm, above three miles long and three-fourths of a mile across. The depth of this chasm was at first about two thousand feet, but as the walls of the crater continued to fall in, it became eventually reduced to less than half that depth. Previous to this eruption, the summit of the cone round the crater had been forty-two hundred feet high. After the eruption, its elevation was found to be reduced to thirty-four hundred feet. Another eruption took place in 1833, and even as late as 1857 and 1858 has Mount Vesuvius given uncomfortably convincing indications that it continues as much alive as ever. End of Part 1 of Chapter 19「Chapter 19 Part 2 of the Fairy Tales of Science by John Cargill Brogue. 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Pluto's Kingdom Continued Mount Etna in Sicily rises 10,874 feet above the level of the sea, of which the lower or bottom part, to the extent of some 3,000 feet, consists of calcareous beds associated with lavas and clays. The remaining seven or 8,000 feet have been formed by successive eruptions from the volcano. The upper 1,100 feet consist of the cone of the crater, which rises from an irregular plain about nine miles in its circumference. The great crater in the summit of this cone is perpetually emitting sulfurous vapors. One of the most remarkable volcanoes is that of Kilauea in the Sandwich Islands, which burns continually, and whose crater contains a sea of red-hot melted lava, sometimes several miles in diameter. The loftiest volcanoes known are those of Orizaba in Mexico and Anthesania and Aconcagua in South America, which are from three to five miles in height. Mount Harula in Mexico offers a curious illustration of volcanic action combined with extensive elevation. This vast mountain rises in the great plain of Marpies, which up to June 1759 was never suspected to be the site of a volcano, although the basaltic hills of the neighborhood clearly indicate that the district had at some very early period been the theater of volcanic eruptions, which had filled up the original valleys. In the month of June 1759, hollow murmurings began to be heard, speedily attended by earthquakes, which followed each other in rapid succession up to the month of September. The surface soil at last swelled up like a large bladder, three or four miles square. It finally burst open in various parts, flames issuing forth through the fissures, and burning fragments of rocks being thrown up high into the air. Six conical vents were thus formed in different parts of the area, of which the lowest was eight hundred feet high. Besides these, thousands of small cones or bosses arose, which cracking subsequently emitted aqueous and sulfurous vapors. These bosses are called in the country hornitos, or small ovens. Toward the close of the month of September, the vast mountain Harula was pushed up bodily in a few days by the subterranean force to an elevation of 1,682 feet, above what had been a plain up to the preceding month of June. The crater of Harula threw out immense streams of basaltic lava, which continued to flow till February 1760, after which the district resumed its former stability, though it still remained far too hot to be habitable. In 1780, twenty years after the outburst, the heat of the Hornitos was still so great that a cigar could readily be lighted by plunging it two or three inches into one of the lateral cracks. When Humboldt visited Harula in 1803, forty-three years after the eruption, he found around the base of the great cone a mass of matter of convex form about five hundred feet high near the cone, but sloping gradually as it receded from it. This mass, which covered to the extent of four square miles, was then still in a heated state, and twenty-two years later, in 1825, Mr. Bullock found the cones still smoking. Previous to the outburst, two purling streams had watered the plain of Malpies, the Cutimbo, and the San Pedro. These two rivers ran into the crater, and lost themselves below the eastern limit of the plain, but reappeared afterwards on the western limit as hot springs. Among the productions of volcanoes emitted or ejected through their craters and vents may be enumerated various gases, such as hydrochloric acid gas, carbonic acid, hydrosulfuric acid, and gases formed by the several combinations of sulfur with oxygen, aqueous vapor, lava, minerals, cinders, stones, sand, water, mud, and ashes, which latter probably consist simply of pulverized lava. The quantity of ashes discharged by volcanoes must be immense. During an eruption of Mount Cosiguiana, a volcano in the Gulf of Fonseca, on the shores of the Pacific, ashes fell as far as Truxillo, on the shores of the Gulf of Mexico. Also, on board a ship, at the time some 1,200 miles westward of the volcano, and four days after the eruption at Kingston in Jamaica, 700 miles eastward from it, having traveled there by an upper current of west wind at the rate of 170 miles a day. For about 30 miles to the south of this volcano, ashes covered the ground three yards and a half deep, and thousands of cattle, wild animals, and birds perished under them. One of the most curious productions of a volcano is mud, 
the aqueous vapour emitted by the crater being condensed by the cold atmosphere, heavy rains are produced, which falling upon the volcanic dust on the sides of the mountain form a current of mud, generally called aqueous lava, which is more dreaded by those dwelling in the vicinity of a volcano than a stream of melted lava. But after all, as this muddy stream is not actually ejected from the crater, but simply formed on the surface of volcanoes by the action of water upon the erupted matter, the term mud volcano is not exactly applicable in such cases. However, in some volcanic districts, mud is occasionally found to ooze from the ground, and there are also, in different parts of the globe, real mud volcanoes, as, for instance, the mud volcano of Jokmali on the peninsula of Absheron in the Caspian Sea, that of Damak in the province of Samarang in the island of Java, the Salces of Gergenti in Sicily, and Sosueto in northern Italy, etc., etc. One of the most remarkable of this class is the one described by Humboldt. This is situated at Turbaco, near Cartagena, in New Granada, South America. It consists of some fifteen or twenty cones, from nineteen to twenty-five feet high, and measuring round the base, from seventy-eight to eighty-five feet each. These cones, or volcancitos, as they are called in the language of the country, have a hollow on the top, measuring from fifteen to thirty inches in diameter, and filled in the driest seasons with muddy water, through which air bubbles are constantly escaping. The temperature of the water is not higher than that of the surrounding atmosphere. Earthquakes are intimately connected with volcanoes. They often precede volcanic eruptions, and arise from the same cause, namely, from the movement of matter in the interior of the earth, only that their action is much more formidable and destructive, and the changes produced by them in the globe are much more varied and extensive. Landslips on the sides of mountains are most frequently attributable to them. They give rise to the formation of new lakes, and cause old ones to disappear, islands are swallowed up by them and new ones arise in the sea as by magic parts of continents subside and sink and others are elevated the relative positions of sea and land are changed and rivers quit their former courses and ancient beds seeking other channels and forming new beds the action or movement of earthquakes is threefold vertical horizontal and gyratory or circular the vertical movement proceeds from below upwards and may be likened to the explosion of a mine in a stone quarry. It produces cracks and fissures in the earth's crust. In many instances the earth opens and closes rapidly. In others portions of the crust slip down into the chasm and disappear forever. It was by a vertical earthquake movement that the city of Messina in Sicily was destroyed in the year 1783. These vertical movements are felt even at sea. Thus, for instance, during the celebrated earthquake at Lisbon in 1755, many ships, at considerable distances from the actual focus of the movement, were violently shaken, the concussion in one ship, far out in the Atlantic, being so great that the men were tossed up into the air a foot and a half perpendicularly from the deck. In the horizontal movement, the shock is propagated in a linear direction, producing undulations in the surface of the earth, bearing some resemblance to the waves of the sea, and the sight of which, curious enough, causes a swimming in the head like seasickness. These undulatory shocks in a linear direction must of course be understood to move in waves of great breadth as well as length. The horizontal earthquake movement which visited Syria in 1837 was felt in a line 500 miles long by 90 miles wide. In accordance with the general law in mechanics, the undulations of horizontal earthquake movements finish by cracking the superficial soil and strata of the earth's crust in the earthquake which in eighteen eleven convulsed the district of new madrid south carolina the surface earth between new madrid and little prairie rose in great undulations to a considerable height till the earth waves burst when volumes of water and sand and masses of pit coal were hurled up through the crevices high into the air large lakes of twenty miles in extent were on this occasion formed in the course of a single hour, while some of the ancient lakes of the district were drained and completely dried up. As a general rule, horizontal shocks proceeding onward unresisted are not considered to be very dangerous. The most terrible horizontal earthquakes are those where the shocks, proceeding from two different foci of action, happen to cross each other. A town standing on the ground at the point of intersection of the two waves 
has little chance indeed of escaping the crash and crush produced by their meeting in the circular or gyratory movement the earthquake action moves in a circuit sometimes very extensive in other but rare instances a very small compass in the latter case the movement proves generally most dangerous and destructive of which the earthquakes at quito in 1797 and in calabria in 1783 afford convincing illustrations in cases of this description it has happened that solid walls have changed their place with the masonry perfectly undisturbed rows of trees straight and parallel have been inflected and more remarkable still entire fields with different sorts of grain growing in them have exchanged places and crops humboldt tells us that at riobamba south america destroyed by the terrific convulsion of seventeen ninety seven he was shown a place among the ruins where the whole furniture of one house had been carried bodily by the movement of the earthquake under the roof of another as an illustration of a circular movement upon an immense scale may be instanced the famous earthquake which destroyed lisbon in november seventeen fifty five and afforded the great pompal the opportunity of erecting those solid wooden frame stone buildings that have so gloriously withstood later shocks even up to the period so recent as november eighteen fifty five and november eighteen fifty eight the shock in this instance was felt in many parts of europe and on the north coast of africa as well as in north america and the west indies as has already been intimated earthquakes are generally attended with more or less extensive elevation or subsidence of land we will give here a few instances in illustration in the earthquake which visited jamaica in sixteen ninety two several large storehouses in the harbour of port royal subsided to a depth of between twenty four and forty eight feet under water apparently without disturbing the masonry as the buildings remained standing with the tops of the chimneys erect above the water a large tract of land around the town about one thousand acres in extent subsided in less than a minute and was covered over by the waters of the sea the fearful shock which destroyed lima in peru in seventeen forty six submerged the entire coast near callao converting it into a bay of the sea in the great earthquake of seventeen fifty five the new quay at lisbon then recently built of massive and solid marble on which a vast number of people had collected for safety sank suddenly down with its living load and not one of the bodies ever rose to the surface again and more extraordinary still a number of boats and ships lying at anchor a little distance off the quay went suddenly down with the body of water beneath them as into a whirlpool and not a fragment of the wrecks was ever after seen upon sounding the spot afterwards it was ascertained to be some six hundred feet deep before the earthquake which visited messina in 1783 the ground along the port of that city was perfectly level after the shock it was found to slope considerably towards the sea the latter itself getting deeper and deeper as the distance from the shore increased an indication that the sloping of the coast continued far under the water and that accordingly the bottom of the sea must have sunk as well as the shore during the same earthquake many houses in the streets of the town of terranova in calabria were raised above their usual level others sank down in the ground near the town was a circular tower of solid masonry part of this tower remained undestroyed but one side of it was lifted up by the action of the earthquake much above the other the foundations of the upraised portion being laid bare to the view though strange to say the divided walls were found to adhere throughout as firmly to each other and to fit as closely as if they had been so constructed on purpose and cemented together from the beginning towards the close of the last century a remarkable subsidence took place in north america just above the falls of the columbia river in eighteen o seven american travellers found here a forest of pines under water standing erect in the body of the river the most extensive elevation of land by earthquake is that which took place in eighteen twenty two on the coast of chile south america in which an area of about one thousand square miles was raised three four six and seven feet above the former level in eighteen nineteen a great subsidence of land took place at the mouth of the river indus in hindustan the bed of the river sinking eighteen feet the sea rushing into the mouth of the indus in a few hours converted a tract of land of some two thousand square miles area into an inland sea 
in the northwest of the subsided district and running in a parallel direction with it one of the level plains about this region some fifty miles in length from east to west and about sixteen miles wide from north to south was uniformly raised ten feet above the level of the delta we will now dismiss this part of the subject with a mere passing allusion to the well-known changes of level of the celebrated temple of Puzulio near naples the rising and sinking of the land in scandinavia and the submarine forests on the shores of england france north america etc and will conclude this chapter with a few brief remarks about submarine volcanoes and extinct volcanoes the subterranean fires the source and cause of volcanic eruptions and earthquakes act also on the beds which form the bottom of the sea when the vents formed by volcanic action lie beneath the waters of the ocean they are called submarine volcanoes the existence and action of submarine volcanoes long suspected and conjectured has since the beginning of this century been clearly proved by the formation of new islands above the waters of the ocean the first well ascertained instance of the elevation of a new island by a submarine eruption occurred in eighteen eleven near st michael in the azores various eruptions had at different times taken place in the neighbourhood during the latter half of eighteen ten several minor shocks had been felt but on the thirty first of january and first of february eighteen eleven the convulsion reached the highest point when sulphurous vapours were seen to rise out of the sea about two miles from the coast and spread in all directions jets of flame attended the rising of these vapours which was speedily followed by columns of volcanic ashes and other erupted materials in about eight days this eruption terminated when it was found that the bottom of the sea previously from three hundred to five hundred feet deep in this spot had been lifted up nearly to a level with the surface of the water about four months later on the thirteenth of june eighteen eleven another eruption took place about two miles and a half from the scene of the former which reached its greatest violence on the seventeenth of june columns of ashes and smoke being whirled up many hundred feet high above the sea at the close of the eruption an island became visible which gradually rose to a height of three hundred feet above the sea captain tillard of the sabrina visited the island which he found rather too hot to walk on and gave it the name of his vessel it presented at one end a conical hill and at the other a deep crater which sent forth jets of flames though it was under water at full tide the continued eruptions of hot stones sand and ashes from the crater raised the conical hill at the one side of the island eventually six hundred feet above the sea however in the last days of february eighteen twelve the entire island sank into the sea and disappeared without leaving a vestige behind in july eighteen eighteen violent spoutings and jettings of steam and water were observed at a spot some thirty miles to the southwest of sicily where the sea was known to be six hundred feet deep on the eighteenth of the month a small island made its appearance with a burning crater in the centre of it ejecting ashes cinders and thick volumes of smoke and covering the sea around with floating cinders and shoals of dead fishes the new island rose gradually to an elevation of nearly two hundred feet above the sea it measured about three miles round at the base the crater in its centre constituted a basin six hundred feet in diameter full of dingy red water boiling after having continued above the sea for nearly three months the island now generally known in the books by the name of graham island sank gradually back into the sea towards the end of october it was again nearly on a level with the surface of the water it disappeared eventually altogether leaving behind however a most dangerous reef of hard volcanic rock just eleven feet under water encompassed by shoals consisting of cinders and sand another volcanic island rose on the coast of iceland during the tremendous eruption of skaptar jokul in seventeen eighty three this island also which was called nyoi sank afterwards down again into the sea some of these volcanic islands are of a more permanent character as for instance the island of new kameni near santorum in the grecian archipelago which was raised up by a submarine volcanic eruption in seventeen o seven and continues to the present day above water there are many mountains whose summits and depressions though now covered with herbage and in some instances the sites of villages and cities bear a close resemblance to the cones and craters of active volcanoes 
and whose constituent rocks are decidedly volcanic. Geologists apply to such mountains the term extinct volcanoes, which, however, is intended to signify simply that no eruption has taken place from them for ages, but by no means implies that they will never be active again. Mount Vesuvius, which at some geological era had clearly been an active volcano, had slumbered for ages in a state of apparent extinction when the terrible eruption that buried Herculaneum and Pompeii under a sea of volcanic ashes revealed once more the true nature of the mountain. In certain localities are found vents which emit only gaseous exhalations and aqueous vapor. Such vents, or sulfataras as they are usually called, are properly looked upon in the light of half-extinct volcanoes, which may at any time suddenly burst forth again with all the terrific violence of true volcanic eruptions. Extinct volcanoes are found not only in volcanic regions, but also in places presenting, with the exception of hot wells and mineral springs, no traces of volcanic activity within historical periods. Among extinct volcanoes, those of central France have attracted most attention. In the districts of Auvergne, Valais, and Vavere, there are seen several hundred volcano-shaped conical hills, with more or less perfectly formed craters on their tops. These conical hills are called in the language of the country puis, which means mountain peaks. They are all of them dome-shaped, varying in height from 500 feet to 2,800 feet above the level of the plain, from which they rise in an irregular chain, 30 miles in length and 2 miles in breadth. The plain itself, some 45 miles long and 20 miles wide, is 1,200 feet above the level of the sea. All the cones are formed of volcanic materials, such as lava, sand, and cinders, and in many of them are found well-defined craters. The highest of these is called Puy de Dome. It is 4,000 feet above the level of the sea. It is composed entirely of volcanic materials, and has a regular crater, measuring 1,500 feet round and 300 feet deep. On the top of another of these remarkable cones, called the Puy de Perhu, there is a very deep extinct crater, a mile round, which is now closed in and covered with turf and grass. From the lower part of this conical hill a stream of lava has issued, which lies there now, rugged and black, covering the plain with volcanic cinders to the depth of about twenty feet. Similar extinct volcanoes are found in the south of Sicily, the neighborhood of Naples, Hungary, the lower provinces of the Rhine, and the north of Spain. In England, Scotland, and Ireland, although no such specimens of extinct volcanoes in the form of hills with cones and craters are found, yet rocks of volcanic origin abound, and there can be no doubt but that the remarkable basaltic rocks of Staffa and the Giant's Causeway are the productions of an extinct volcano. The absence of cones and craters and of streams of cooled lava issuing from the bases of the basaltic hills of the British Isles is owing simply to the circumstance that the eruptions of these volcanoes, in the period of their activity, took place under the bed of the ocean. End of chapter 19「Twenty, Part One of the Fairy Tales of Science by John Cargill Brogue. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Wonderful Lamp. No, the great genius of this land has many a light aerial band, who all beneath his high command, harmoniously, as arts or arms they understand, their labors ply. Burns. Genii, Afrites, and Ghouls have long since lost their terrors but the wonderful stories told about them will continue to charm the youthful mind for centuries to come. Chief among these stories is that of Aladdin, the poor boy who became the fortunate possessor of a wonderful lamp, which gave him control over a powerful race of genii. By merely rubbing the lamp he summoned these superhuman servants, who waited on him hand and foot, brought him untold wealth, transported him from place to place, and fulfilled his wildest desires. Upon this beautiful Arabian romance, we ground our concluding fairy tale of science. Our wonderful lamp is merely a poetical image of science. The lamp of science dispels intellectual darkness, and floods the world with its all-penetrating light. The night-prowling ghouls, ignorance and superstition, dare not encounter its glancing rays, and descend shrieking into the abyss, while industry toils in the glare and seems to acquire new vigor whenever the flame increases in brilliancy. 
the attendant genii of this wonderful lamp are those powers of the material world which have been subjugated by man the aladdin of our story among these genii the most omnipotent agent steam ranks first the miracles wrought by this slave of the lamp transcend all the wonders conceived by the oriental romancists by its agency says dr lardner coal is made to minister in a variety of ways to the uses of society by it coals are taught to spin weave dye print and dress silks cottons woolen and other cloths to make paper and print books on it when made to convert corn into flour, to press oil from the olive and wine from the grape, to draw up metal from the bowels of the earth, to pound and smelt it, to melt and mould it, to forge it, to roll it, and to fashion it into every form that the most wayward caprice can desire. Do we traverse the deep, they lend wings to the ship, and bid defiance to the natural opponents, the winds and the tides. Does the wind-bound ship desire to get out of port to start on her voyage, steam throws its arms around her and places her on the open sea do we traverse the land steam is harnessed to our chariot and we outstrip the flight of the swiftest bird and equal the fury of the tempest we may form an idea of the versatile powers of steam if we consider the manufacture of this volume it was printed by steam upon paper made by steam the rags of which the sheets were formed were woven by steam their separate threads having been previously spun by steam moreover by steam the types were cast in metal that the same agent had raised from the mine by steam too the millboard and cloth which form the cover were fabricated and the thread which fastens the sheets together was twisted the author we have quoted above gives the following excellent illustrations of the power of steam a train of coaches weighing about eighty tons and transporting two hundred and forty passengers with their luggage has been taken from liverpool to birmingham and back from birmingham to liverpool the trip each way taking about four hours and a quarter stoppages included the distance between these places by railway is ninety-five miles the double journey of one hundred and ninety miles was effected by the mechanical force produced in the combustion of four tons of coke the value of which is about five pounds to carry the same number of passengers daily between the same places by stage coaches on a common road would require twenty coaches and an establishment of three thousand eight hundred horses with which the journey in each direction would be performed in about twelve hours stoppages included the circumference of the earth measures twenty five thousand miles if it were begirt with an iron railway such a train as above described carrying two hundred and forty passengers would be drawn round it by the combustion of about thirty tons of coke and the circuit would be accomplished in five weeks in the drainage of the Cornish mines, a bushel of coals usually raises 40,000 tons of water a foot high, but it has, on some occasions, raised 60,000 tons of water the same height. Let us take its labor at 50,000 tons raised one foot high. A horse, worked in a fast stagecoach, pulls against an average resistance of about a quarter of a hundred weight. Against this he is able to work at the usual speed through about eight miles daily. His work is therefore equivalent to 1,000 tons raised one foot. A bushel of coals, consequently, as used in Cornwall, performs as much labor as a day's work of 50 such horses. The Great Pyramid of Egypt stands upon a base measuring 700 feet each way and is 500 feet high, its weight being 12,760 millions of pounds. Herodotus states that in constructing it, 100,000 men were constantly employed twenty years the materials of this pyramid would be raised from the ground to their present position by the combustion of about four hundred and eighty tons of coal the manai bridge consists of about two thousand tons of iron and its height above the level of the water is one hundred and twenty feet its mass might be lifted from the level of the water to its present position by the combustion of four bushels of coal the reader will hardly require to be informed that the above illustrations show what might be done by the steam generated during the combustion of certain quantities of coal provided its entire strength could be applied to the fulfillment of the required results let us now briefly consider some of the real achievements of steam and other genii over which man as the holder of the lamp of science has absolute control 
the great eastern or leviathan that stupendous product of engineering daring is a structure immeasurably more wonderful than aladdin's palace while this ship was in course of construction the genii of the lamp had no rest and their cyclopean labors excited the wonder of all beholders although building in the midst of the largest collection of seafaring people in the world the leviathan was a puzzle to them all none of the old accustomed sights and sounds of shipbuilding attended the growth of this monster of the deep the visitor to the works of scott russell and company at millwall looked in vain for the merry ship carpenters caulking away with monotonous dead-sounding blows for the artisans chipping with their adzes rearing up huge ribs or laying the massive keel and for the bright augers gleaming in the sun as sturdy arms worked out the bolt holes what he did see might well excite his surprise he saw the giant arm of steam welding huge shafts and punching inch plates of iron as quickly and as noiselessly as a lady punches cardboard for a fancy fair ornament steel urged by the same potent genie was seen showing its mastery over iron while the huge lathes revolved and the planing machine steadily pursued its resistless course whilst in place of the shavings of the carpenter long ringlets of a dull grey metal cumbered the ground the ship carpenter was transmuted into a brawny smith and the civil engineer had taken the place of the marine architect the leviathan is essentially an iron ship more completely so perhaps than any vessel hitherto built iron plates angle irons and iron rivets form the sinews muscles and bones of this monster of the age of iron the plates vary in thickness from half an inch to an inch the rivets are about an inch in diameter and it is these that hold the vast fabric together in fastening the plates the mighty genie heat lent his aid when the holes in the plates to be held together had been brought into exact opposition bolts at a white heat were one by one introduced and firmly riveted whilst in that condition by three men one holding the bolt in its position by placing a hammer against its head on the inside of the ship whilst the other two with alternate blows produced the rivet head on the outside the rivets contracted in cooling and drew the plates together with the force of a vice before the ship could swim no less than two millions of these bolts had to be made secure we will not attempt to give a minute description of this steam-made vessel but will confine our observations to those points in which the leviathan differs from other ships let us first consider the form of the great ship viewed endwise its outline is nearly square for the bottom is perfectly flat throughout a breadth of forty feet without a keel or any other protuberance its broad side is almost a perfect quadrangle quite horizontal at the top and very nearly vertical at the two ends but although the general outline of the leviathan is formed of nearly straight lines this ship has curves of wondrous delicacy curves that bring the bow to the sharpness of a wedge by gradations which the eye can scarcely follow while the stern below the low water line has convexities and hollows gradually melting into each other the leviathan is constructed on the wave line principle that is to say there is a certain similarity between the curves of the hull and the curves of a wave the best form of a ship which should force its way through the water so as to meet with the least resistance from the fluid was until recently unknown the head and breast of a fish and the breast of a duck or swan were the favorite models for the ship's bow these forms were somewhat modified by experience but they still remain the types some five and twenty years ago mr scott russell then an unknown shipbuilder ventured to question the fitness of these two forms the fish form would be the best and most perfect undoubtedly provided the ship swam under water like a fish instead of half in and half out and the duck's breast bow might prove faultless if a vessel were merely required to float along the surface like a duck and not to swim with speed but he saw that the best constructed ships heaped up a mass of water before them and that the resistance of this anterior wave could not be overcome without an unprofitable expenditure of power every vessel in passing over the sea displaces a certain amount of water proportional to its size and draught and then the water closes in behind her to fill up the hollow scott russell at length discovered the form of ship that would offer the least resistance to the water he found that the lines or curvature of the bow of a ship ought to resemble the curvature of the wave of displaced water 
and that the stern should be curved like the wave of replacement. The mark that still water makes on the hull of a ship floating on it is called the water line. Scott Russell called his curve the wave line, because he found it precisely the same as the line which the wave of displaced water marked along the side of a ship, by which it harmlessly glided without impeding its motion. To test the merits of the wave line principle, 150 models were constructed, and no less than 20,000 experiments were made, which all tended towards one result, the desirability of assimilating the form of a ship in certain parts to the shape of waves. The great point in practical navigation is to obtain a passage for a ship by removing or displacing the particles of water as quietly as possible, and to no further distance on either side than the greatest width of the vessel. On one occasion Scott Russell caused a model boat, seventy-five feet long, to be drawn along a canal at a very high speed, and made the prow pass between two oranges floating on the water. These oranges, which represented on a large and visible scale two particles of water, were observed merely to touch the sides of the vessel until they got amidships, where they remained quiescent until they closed in behind the stern. The first boat constructed on the new principle was called the Wave. This little yacht, some seventy feet long and seven and a half tons burden, verified all the inventor's predictions, and may be said to have heralded in a new era of shipbuilding. The Leviathan, as far as its lines are concerned, is but a magnified copy of the little wave boat, and there is little doubt that it will eclipse all other vessels in speed, as well as in vastness, whenever it has a chance of displaying its powers. We have dwelt upon the waveline principle, as man is solely indebted to the wonderful lamp for its discovery. The form of least resistance could never have been discovered by accident. The old shipbuilders jumped at the conclusion that the fish's head and the duck's breast were the only perfect types of a vessel's bow. But the magic waveline could not be introduced into naval architecture until science had revealed the true laws of fluid motion and resistance. We have said that the hull of the Leviathan is formed of unyielding plates of inch iron, also that this gigantic hull has innumerable curves, which die away into each other by insensible gradations. At the first glance these two statements appear irreconcilable. How can these delicate curves be produced by any aggregation of rectilinear pieces of flat boilerplate? In ordinary wooden ships the planking by its elasticity allows itself to be modelled to the ribs but here there are no ribs, in the true sense of the word, and the form of the vessel must depend upon the inclination given to each separate piece of iron before the fastening process is commenced. And such, in fact, is the case. Every individual plate, before being fixed in its proper position, was the subject of a separate study to the engineer. Of the thirty thousand plates that compose the hulk of this great ship, only a few, situated in the midship section, are alike either in size or curve. For each a model in wood or template, as it is technically called, had originally to be made, and by these patterns the plates were cut to their required shape by the huge steam shears, in exactly the same manner as a tailor cuts out various portions of a garment. The list, or inclination given to each plate, was the next process, and this was produced by passing the plate through a system of rollers, which could be so reversed in their action and so adjusted as to give any required curve. The Leviathan was not built in the usual manner. There was no skeleton to indicate what it was about to become. The reason of this was that on account of the enormous length of the ship it was necessary to make use of a different mode of construction to that generally pursued in building ships. And for this purpose the tubular principle, so successfully carried out by Robert Stevenson in the Manai Bridge, was adopted. The framework of the ship may be described as consisting, primarily, of thirty-five horizontal webs or ribs of iron plate, each nearly three feet wide, and immensely strengthened at all the points of junction. They extend from end to end of the vessel, side by side at the bottom, and one over the other at the sides, at distances varying from three to five feet apart. On either side the uppermost web is about five feet above low water mark, these webs are crossed by huge partitions of a similar construction placed just sixty feet apart. Plates of the best and toughest iron are riveted on each side of the thirty-five longitudinal webs or ribs so as to form a double skin to the ship 
or a dermis and epidermis. The Leviathan is therefore two ships, one within the other. The whole framework forms a system of cells, which, like the Manai tube, combines extreme lightness with great strength. So thoroughly close are the joints of this framework, we quote with some modification the words of a competent authority, that any one cell could hold water without its running into the adjoining cells, and water is actually to be admitted to some of them to assist in ballasting or in trimming ship, or in giving it a lift or tilt-up when the bottom needs repair, taps and valves being arranged for that purpose. Above the level already named, five feet higher than low water mark, the hull is formed of bars and plates as below, but it is not cellular, being only one layer in thickness. The various decks, whole and partial, are mostly formed of iron. The upper deck is so strong that it is calculated that the whole weight of the vessel might be suspended from it. Like the lower part of the hull, it has a cellular structure, and will help to maintain the bulging sides in their places, at the same time that it supports the visible wooden deck. At the bow or head of the vessel, the decks and partitions, the walls and casings, the supports and angle irons are so numerous that the whole forms a mass nearly as strong as solid iron. To strengthen the interior of the mighty ship, to define its shape, and to separate it into watertight compartments, the ten bulkheads or cross walls of thick iron plate, already alluded to, extend from side to side and from top to bottom, with no openings whatever below the level of the passenger saloons. So impermeable are these walls that, according to the view of the builders, any one of the twelve compartments into which the ship is thus divided might be filled with water without flooding those adjacent to it, and accordingly a hole rent in the hull would, so to speak, only have one-tenth part of a chance in sinking the vessel. Besides these transverse walls, there are two longitudinal iron walls running along rather more than half the length of the vessel. It will thus be seen that the hollow as well as the shell of the vast fabric is cellular. What with the two iron decks, the two longitudinal iron walls, and the ten transverse iron walls, besides partial decks and walls of smaller size, the interior is made into a series of sixty or eighty vast iron boxes, a honeycomb of quadrangular cells, the walls of which give strength mutually one to another. Let a strain come in whatever direction it may, there is an iron wall ready to baffle it. The engineers may possibly be too sanguine, but they believe the Leviathan will prove the tautest, trimmest, driest ship ever built, irrespective of its more important qualities. They comfort those who dread seasickness with the hope that a ship too long to pitch and too flat to roll will be bearable even to the gentlemen of England who live at home at ease, and they talk of the ship being buoyant even if chopped into ten ships, like those animals which seem to have ten lives instead of one. It is not easy to form an adequate idea of the dimensions of this iron monster. When we recollect that the Great Western, which twenty years ago was regarded as a marvel of vastness, is two hundred and thirty-six feet long, the Great Britain, the first ocean screw steamer, is three hundred and twenty-two feet long, and the majestic Himalaya is three hundred and seventy feet long, we may get, by comparison, a rough notion of the magnitude of the Leviathan, which is six hundred and eighty feet long between the perpendiculars, and six hundred and ninety-one feet on the upper deck. The breadth of the hull is eighty-three feet, the extreme breadth across the paddle boxes one hundred and eighteen feet, and the depth from deck to keel fifty-eight feet. In the construction of the hull, thirty thousand iron plates were used, and these plates were fastened with two million rivets. The weight of iron in the hull amounts to eight thousand tons, and the weight of the entire vessel when voyaging with its passengers, crew, coals, and cargo on board will be from twenty-five thousand to thirty thousand tons. Many ingenious comparisons have been made to enable the mind to form a true conception of the value of the above figures. The London streets and squares have frequently been selected as familiar illustrations of the Leviathan's dimensions. Thus it has been said that if any gigantic power could transport the monster to Pall Mall or Street, or St. James Street, the hull would not sink to the roadway, as its sides would rest on the opposite parapets. Even Regent Street would not receive it without the paddle boxes, 
and with those appendages the broadest street in london portland place would barely afford it room the paddle wheels alone are higher than any but the highest houses if stretched over russell square one end would rest on the housetops of the north side and the other on those of the south everything related to the leviathan has a magnitude proportional to that of the vast hull thus alexis sawyer the celebrated chef de cuisine made a calculation that one hundred persons could dine in one of its funnels and actually proposed that a banquet should be spread for five hundred guests in the five chimneys before they were fitted to the ship let us now briefly consider the arrangements that have been made to give the iron monster life and motion mr brunel decided not to trust so precious a human freight and so vast an amount of cargo as his big ship is designed to carry to any single propelling power but resolved to supply it with three the screw the paddle and the sail the paddle wheels which are considerably larger than the circus at astley's are to be propelled by monster engines the motive power of which will be generated by four boilers each weighing about fifty tons and containing forty tons of water these engines the largest ever constructed with oscillating cylinders are nevertheless inferior to those devoted to the screw propeller this screw is twenty-four feet in diameter and weighs thirty-six tons its four fans which were cast separately and afterwards fitted into a large cast iron boss have been aptly compared to the blade bones of some huge animal of the pre-adamite world besides being pulled along by the paddles and pushed along by the screw the leviathan will also be propelled by the wind when exceptional circumstances render such aid desirable there are six masts five of iron and one of wood and on these masts will or may be spread about six thousand five hundred square yards of canvas under ordinary circumstances the leviathan will go faster than the wind and sails will prove an impediment rather than an assistance to the ship's progress it is not probable therefore that they will be much resorted to except for the purpose of steadying or of helping to steer the huge vessel the steam power will be truly enormous it has been stated that were everything put to work at its fullest the whole series of engines would work up to eleven thousand five hundred horsepower this power would suffice to raise two hundred thousand gallons of water to the top of the monument in less than a minute or to work all the cotton mills of manchester when all the engines are in full work the great source of power coal will be needed to the extent of two hundred and fifty tons each day for a voyage to australia and back twelve thousand tons at the very least will be required yet such is the capacity of the leviathan for fuel that this immense quantity can be stowed away in the coal bunkers without encroaching at all on the space set apart for machinery cargo passengers and crew the great ship will carry twenty little ships all fitted with masts and sails complete in addition to these two small screw steamers will hang astern abaft the paddle boxes each of which will be one hundred feet long sixteen feet beam one hundred and twenty tons burthen and forty horsepower these will be raised and lowered by auxiliary steam engines and will be used for landing and embarking passengers with their luggage they will look like toy steamers when suspended at the sides of the sea monster though they will be considerably larger than most of the above bridge thames steamers the passenger arrangements are on a corresponding scale with everything else there are ample means for accommodating four thousand guests in this floating city besides the crew of four hundred the iron partitions we have already described divide the interior capacity of the hull into separate compartments or boxes and into each box we may suppose a large house to be let down a clever writer has thus filled up in imagination five of these great boxes if we were to take the row of houses belonging to mivarts and drop them down one gulf take farrance's and drop it down a second take morley's at charing cross and fit it into a third and adjust the great western hotel at paddington and the great northern at king's cross into apertures four and five we should get some faint idea of the nature of the accommodation in the great eastern we have only adverted to a few of the wonders of this leviathan this floating palace of aladdin which owes its existence to the potent genii of the lamp of science although this crowning marvel of our wondrous age still rests in the thames like a giant spellbound 
we cannot doubt that it has a mighty future before it. All who watched the Leviathan's growth and followed its progress along the launching ways must long to see it walk the waters like a thing of life and show its mastery over those waves which it so closely resembles in its graceful curves. In justice to the wise men, Brunel and Russell, who have wrought such miracles in the subjugation of the powers of nature, the genii of our wonderful lamp, we trust that the merits of their daring achievement in shipbuilding will soon be tested. End of part one of chapter twenty. Chapter twenty, part two of the Fairy Tales of Science by John Cargill Brogue. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Wonderful Lamp continued. Let us now glance at another marvelous product of science which rivals all the magical fabrics described in the Arabian Nights. We refer to the Britannia Bridge across the Manai Straits. The deep chasm which separates the Isle of Anglesey from the mainland had long been a serious obstacle to the modern Aladdin, who could not brook the delay which attended the use of ferry boats. He could not rest satisfied until he had bridged over the intervening strip of sea, and he therefore summoned the potent genii of the lamp, who helped him to form a magical roadway in mid-air. This cobweb-like structure is known as the Suspension Bridge of Telford. In course of time, however, Aladdin began to wish for a more substantial fabric, across which he might urge his steam-drawn chariot. To obtain such a bridge as he desired, he sought the aid of a potent magician, who had long been famed for his power over the genii of the lamp. In plain language, a railway bridge across the Manai Straits was required, and its construction was left to Mr. Robert Stevenson. The seven labors of Hercules were insignificant tasks compared with that which the railway authorities set before the great engineer, perfectly satisfied that he would accomplish it by some means or other. Yet the difficulties which Stevenson had to contend with seemed insurmountable, and a less daring genius would have shrunk from encountering them. Those captive princesses of fairy lore who were doomed to draw water from a well without a bucket, to catch fish without a net, and to spin a thread without either wheel or distaff, were not more unfortunately situated than was Robert Stevenson, though he has never yet been made the hero of a romantic story. "'You must build a bridge,' said his employers, "'that the heaviest trains may pass over in safety at any speed. This bridge may have any form you please, but we wish you to remember that its rupture would be attended with most disastrous consequences, and we therefore urge upon you the necessity of making it strong enough to resist every strain." "'If you build a railway bridge across the Straits,' said the Lords of the Admiralty, "'you must not interfere with the navigation. Your viaduct must be at least one hundred feet above the level of the water, so that ships may pass beneath, and it must be constructed without the aid of scaffolding.' Even the elements seemed to set their face against the proposed bridge. The Straits are above twelve miles in length, the shores throughout being rocky and precipitous. The water that fills the passage is never at rest, and the fall of the tide is from twenty to twenty-five feet. Moreover, the wind blows through the straits with such violence that a bridge must be strong indeed to withstand its rude shocks. Imagine an enchanted engineer with such a task before him as the construction of a bridge a hundred feet above the tumultuous waters without scaffolding of any kind, and you will be able to get a faint idea of the difficulties which he had to overcome before a railway train could pass from Carnarvon to Anglesley. We will not allude to the various plants which Stevenson conceived and discarded before the idea of a tubular bridge took possession of his mind. This last project, destined to prove so successful, has been well compared to a beam along which a man scrambles when escaping from a fire. Stevenson was bent upon crossing the straits, but as he could not build an ordinary bridge, when under such extraordinary restrictions, he resolved to span the waters with a huge makeshift in the shape of a hollow beam of iron. Each tube of the Britannia Bridge is literally a beam, so constructed that it combines the maximum of strength with the minimum of weight. In other words, it is a beam from which every portion of metal that does not add to its strength has been carefully removed. We will now endeavor to explain the simple principle upon which a beam, whether of wood or iron, is enabled to support the weight imposed upon it. 
For want of a few moments' reflection, most people, in looking up at a common ceiling girder, consider that its upper and lower parts suffer equally in bearing the weight of the roof. But these upper and lower strata suffer from causes as diametrically opposite to each other as the climates of the pole and of the equator. The top of the beam throughout its whole length suffers from severe compression, the bottom from severe extension, and thus, while the particles of the one are violently jammed together, the particles of the other are on the point of separation. In short, the difference between the two is precisely that which exists between the opposite punishments of vertically crushing a man to death under a heavy weight and of horizontally tearing him to pieces by horses. This theory, confused as it may appear in words, can at once be simply and most beautifully illustrated by any small straight stick freshly cut from a living shrub. In its natural form, the bark or rind around the stick is equally smooth throughout. But if the little bough, held firmly in each hand, be bent downwards so as to form a bow, or in other words, to represent a beam under heavy pressure, two opposite results will instantly appear. The rind in the center of the upper part of this stick will be crumpled up, while that on the opposite side will be severely distended, thus denoting, or rather demonstrating, what we have stated, namely, that beneath the rind the wood of the upper part of the stick is severely compressed, while that underneath is as violently stretched. Indeed, if we continue to bend the bow until it breaks, the splinters of the upper fracture will be seen to interlace or cross each other, while those beneath will be divorced by a chasm. But it is evident on reflection that these opposite results of compression and extension must, as they approach each other, respectively diminish in degree, until in the middle of the beam, termed by mathematicians its neutral axis, the two antagonistic forces, like the celebrated Kilkenny cats, destroy each other. It therefore appears that the main strength of a beam consists in its power to resist compression and extension, and that the middle is comparatively useless, so that to obtain the greatest amount of strength, the given quantity of material to be used should be accumulated at the top and bottom, where the strain is greatest, or, in plain terms, the middle of the beam, whether of wood or iron, should be bored out. All iron girders, all beams in houses, in fact all things in domestic or naval architecture that bear weight, are subject to the same law. A hollow beam of iron having been fixed upon as the form which the projected bridge should take, an extensive series of experiments were undertaken with a view to ascertain the shape capable of sustaining the greatest weight. A rectangular tube, with a height considerably greater than its breadth, and strengthened at the top and bottom, was eventually selected. The genii of the lamp were now set to work, and the quiet folk of North Wales witnessed similar wonders to those which have since astonished the Londoners. The principal tubes were constructed on piles at high-water mark, and were formed of wrought iron plates riveted together with white-hot iron bolts. A system of longitudinal tubes or cells gave the required strength to the top and bottom of each fabric, these cells being quite as effectual as solid metal. Every means was taken to make the tubes as light as possible, as it was known that the strength of the bridge depended on its lightness. This fact sounds rather paradoxical, but if the reader will reflect a moment, he will find that a bridge has to support itself, as well as the things passing over it. A beam of solid iron, of the dimensions of the Britannia Bridge, would be useless if placed across the straits, as it would infallibly break down under the enormous pressure of its own weight. Stevenson's beam, as we have already intimated, has all the elements of strength, but none of the elements of weakness of a common beam. While the monster tubes were being constructed, the masons were heaping up sandstone and marble into the huge piers upon which they were to rest. The central pier or tower was built upon a little rock in the middle of the stream. This rock, which was only exposed at low water, had long been a trouble to sailors and nothing else, but it is now world famous as the Britannia Rock, the chief support of Stevenson's magic aerial galleries. Two other piers were constructed, one on the Anglesey and the other on the Carnarvon shore, each at a distance of 472 feet from the Britannia Tower. The bridge was to consist of two tubes placed side by side, one for the down and the other for the up trains. Each tube was formed in four lengths, 
and when completed these lengths had to be joined together like the pieces of a huge dissected puzzle a huge puzzle indeed when these immense tubes were finished how could they be thrown across the straits a hundred feet above the level of the water the reader will open his eyes in astonishment when we inform him that the four principal tubes each four hundred and seventy-two feet in length were floated into the centre of the strait and then pumped up to their present elevated position said we not that science had brought the powers of nature under man's control that the genii of the lamp had become the willing slaves of the modern aladdin each tube was supported on pontoons huge life-boys if you will and dragged from its resting place by chains connected with a monster windlass stationed on the opposite bank this operation was performed at high tide and when the water sank the delighted spectators beheld the tube resting in its proper position between its two towers we need scarcely say that we refer to the direction of the tube but not to its height when we here speak of its proper position the mass of iron had yet to be lifted high into the air among the genii of the lamp there is one called fluid pressure and to this power the task of raising the tubes was committed the hydraulic press gave direction to the mighty efforts of this genie this engine consists essentially of a strong metallic cylinder in which is inserted a solid piston or ram and a pump by means of which water can be forced into the main cylinder many of these machines were employed in raising the different lengths of the bridge but one of them deserves particular mention on account of its stupendous magnitude the cylinder of this cyclopean engine was nine feet long twenty-two inches in internal diameter ten inches thick and weighed fifteen tons allowing for the waste twenty-two tons of fluid incandescent iron were required for this enormous casting after having been left for seventy-two hours in the mould in which it was cast the mould was detached from it it was still red-hot it was then left to cool but it was ten days before it was sufficiently cool to be approached by operatives well inured to heat in order to detach from it some of the sand of the mould which still adhered to it this vast machine was fixed upon an iron stage near the summit of one of the towers and to the crosshead of the ram were attached massive chains which descended to the level of the water and embraced the tube to be raised the greatest weight lifted by the press was eleven hundred forty four tons but it was capable of raising two thousand tons the quantity of water injected into the great cylinder in order to raise the ram six feet was eighty one and a half gallons when a lift of six feet was effected the lifting chains were seized by a set of clamps under the lowest point to which the cross head descended and while they were thus held suspended the water was discharged from the great cylinder and the ram with its cross head made to descend meanwhile the lengths of chain above the clamps were removed and the chains thus shortened attached to the cross head by other clamps and all was prepared for another lift in the practical operation of the machine each lift of six feet occupied from thirty to forty-five minutes the towers were formed of three massive piers of solid masonry so that each tube just filled up the space between the inner and an outer pier as the tubes were elevated by the action of the press the vacant spaces beneath were closely packed with blocks of wood it was very fortunate that this course was adopted as an accident occurred which must have resulted in the destruction of one of the tubes had the packing process been omitted the water contained in one of the presses not content with lifting the tube thought fit to make a display of its power by thrusting the bottom out of the cylinder thereby killing an unfortunate workman the monster tube fell one inch but was prevented from falling any further by the packing beneath had it fallen six feet it would have been shivered into atoms when all the tubes were elevated to their permanent position the great work was completed and aladdin gazed at the new wonder with delighted eyes these aerial galleries nearly fifteen hundred feet in length are marvellously strong each being capable of bearing spread over its whole surface the enormous weight of four thousand tons a weight nine times greater than it can ever be required to sustain the hollow beam is not deflected more than an inch from the horizontal line by the passage of the heaviest luggage train and it is scarcely affected at all by the highest wind 
the enchanted engineer whom we whilom saw beset with difficulties of no ordinary kind can now point to the twin tubes across the manai straits and say proudly my task is performed the bridge has been constructed without scaffolding and little mona is no longer separated from her mighty sister we need scarcely say that mr stevenson is treated quite as badly as the ogre guarded princess for no sooner has he performed one task than the ogre called nineteenth century finds him another still more impossible to all appearances than the last let us not forget that although the human mind can plan a britannia bridge or a great eastern the human hands could never construct such wonderful fabrics without the assistance of those mighty powers of the material world which man by industry and patient observation has succeeded in enslaving steam heat light electricity indeed every agent that is known to exert power in the natural world can be made to labor in the world of art these forces then are the genii that attend the lamp of science this lamp like that of aladdin must be rubbed before the genii will appear in plain language science will not reveal its mighty powers unless the student works diligently our artist has pictured the lamp of science as a luminous hand what is the meaning of this curious emblem reflect for a moment and you will detect a deep truth hidden in this fancy science dear reader is the magical hand that points out truth and strikes down falsehood and more than that it is the magical hand which fashions the crude materials of the world in objects of beauty which constructs and moves all kinds of machinery which performs herculean feats of strength and executes works of marvellous delicacy but what has science to do with the wolf and the hog at the bottom of the emblem nothing indeed except to keep them out of mischief the wolf stands for the lawless man who preys upon his fellow mortals and lives by crime the hog for the ignorant glutton who wallows in the mire of indolence devouring everything that comes in his way we trust that these brutes in human form will one day become extinct and that the chains which depend from our wonderful lamp will be no longer needed at present however it is absolutely necessary to restrain the wolf from interfering with those who labor in the light of science and the hog from devouring their well-earned food having thus pointed a moral in the emblem that adorns our concluding tale we have now to bid the reader farewell an unpleasant task is this leave-taking dear reader we have journeyed together for some time and now we feel as though we were parting from an old friend we have treated you very rudely we fear we have dragged you hither and thither without once asking you whether you like such wandering habits we have led you through the ancient forests have soared with you to the confines of space have plunged with you into the sea and in fine have taken you everywhere we trust that you bear us no malice and will not think that time wasted which was spent in listening to our fairy tales of science the end end of chapter 20 end of the fairy tales of science